Dr. Richard Johnson, welcome back on the podcast. I'd love to jump right in. You have some new findings here as it's related to Alzheimer's that you're here to discuss with us. Some things that actually have major potential implications on how people eat and most importantly, how we potentially get to the root cause of this very, very scary disease. So welcome back on. I'm excited to talk about it with you all. <laughs> Thank you, Drew. It's really a pleasure to be on. So. so tell us about what you found. You and a team are proposing a new hypothesis about Alzheimer's and its relationship to something called fructose. So yeah. tell us what it is. Well, so the, the cause of Alzheimer's has been a big mystery for a, a very, very long time. And, and, uh, and there have been di different hypotheses that have been brought up. But we, uh, we have a hypothesis that we think is, is actually fairly strong at trying to explain the cause of this disease. Um, so, you know, Alzheimer's, you know, the physician Alzheimer described these patients that developed dementia. And he uh, then at autopsy, he showed that they had characteristic lesions in their brain, uh, one being amyloid plaques, which are these kind of protein uh, amalgam of protein proteinaceous material that is uh, in the in the brain itself around the neurons. And also- uh, Kind of like we have plaque on the T. Yeah. People think of plaque in the arteries. <laughs> exactly. There's actually some plaque in the brain. Right. So it, it, he uh, observed these amyloid plaques and the, these things that he called neurofibrillary tangles, which turned out to be an accumulation of an unusual protein called tau. And, uh, and so this became the characteristic finding for uh, deme uh, for Alzheimer's dementia. It was a disease associated with amyloid plaques, tau protein, and kind of a shrunken brain. And the, the question is, what caused that? Right. And, and, for, and just to interject here, for years, we've spent billions and billions and billions of dollars coming up with different therapeutics right. that are trying to address that plaque. And so far, it's been unsuccessful. Right. I mean, there are a couple of treatments out there that do kind of remove some of the amyloid plaque, but they're not particularly that successful. You know, they don't really cure the disease. And, uh, and, and so they may provide a little bit benefit, but uh, everyone's searching for something more. So uh, our hypothesis kind of explains the story of Alzheimer's pretty much from the beginning until the end. And so, uh, no, I don't think there have been too many hypotheses that have actually shown how it can be initiated and how it can drive the whole course of the disease. And the important thing is it's, it looks like it's a preventable disease. It looks like it's driven by certain types of diets. And, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to you about it today. Yeah, well, I'm so excited. And before we go into it, you know, one thing that's also really tricky, and it's kind of very similar to the conversation around obesity that's there today, right? Right. Um, there are so many different camps, and one of the biggest camps that's out there is arguing that obesity, you hear it sometimes on the news, on places like 60 Minutes, oh, it's a genetic thing. Right. And if we can only come up with the right drug, you know, something like Ozempic, then we can get to the root issue. But any grade school student can take a step back, even if there's a place for these drugs, and can say, huh, this is a little weird. Just a hundred years ago, obesity rates weren't at the level that they are right now. And in a similar way, we could apply that same level of thinking to Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes. So, you know, so there has been this, uh, when, when Alzheimer came out and, and reported these cases between about 1910 and 1950, there was like only 30 or 40 cases published. You know, I mean, that's hardly any. Uh, one of the problems were that uh, they, no one was really uh, reporting autopsies of people who are very old, what they called senile dementia. And now we know that senile dementia is frequently Alzheimer's. So there could have been a lot more cases uh, way back when. But, but, the, but the data suggests that Alzheimer's really is increasing dramatically over the last several decades, not just because we're living longer, but because if, even if you do... Uh, you know, look at people who are 65, the, the number of people, the percentage of people with Alzheimer's is increasing f at each age, uh, at each year. So th there does seem to be a real increase in Alzheimer's in the last few years. And it's hard to say genetics could drive that when you see this significant rise. Alzheimer's now like the sixth most common cause of death. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a devastating disease, both for the patient and for the family. So trying to figure out the cause is really important. Yeah. And so 
we know it's not genetics or it's probably most likely not the primary driver because we've seen this explosion. We also know it's not diagnosis by itself, right? Sometimes people are like, oh, well, medicine is advancing so much. We just get be we're getting better at finding these things, which also coincides with the fact that people are living longer. But as you mentioned, that's not the case. And I think I've seen, saw a news report like a month or two ago that even people in their like mid fifties, like some of the first cases of Alzheimer's you're starting to see with individuals at that age, which is very scary. It could even yeah. be younger than that. Yeah. Do you know of people anybody any younger than that? Uh, no, that's that's pretty young. But um, yeah, there are cases that occur earlier than that. But in general, you know, it's a, uh, it's usually in the '60s and '70s that Alzheimer's will, you know, some of the earlier cases are like in the '50s and '60s. Yeah. Totally. And so this all leads to the place of what has happened that either our environment has changed significantly or something is going on. So let's now talk about your hypothesis with some of the authors that uh, you co-wrote this paper in. And so remind us, what was the name of the journal that this was uh, published it, in? It was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And uh, I have to begin by saying, I'm not a neurologist, but I've been studying obesity and sugar and diet uh, for many years. So it was really important for me when we were kind of looking at this hypothesis to you, to uh, communicate it to neurologists, people who are expert uh, on Alzheimer's so that I could, and, and, you know, uh, tell them about the hypothesis, discuss it with them, work with them on it. And, and so I was very lucky that David Perlmutter uh, and Dale Bredesen, who are two fantastic neurologists, uh, uh, I, you know, joined me on this hypothesis, as well as some other people like Maria Nagel, who's a expert on Alzheimer's disease and is based at the University of Colorado. So Drew, whenever you come up with an idea, it's always wise to find the experts to 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 work with, you know, in that area, so that uh, so that you know your it strengthens your hypothesis. You get feedback; they can help, they can fill in the gaps, and it, you end up with a stronger story. So yeah, absolutely. That was my and, case. and for those that are watching on YouTube, you know, most are listening on audio. But if you are watching on YouTube, we have a link to the uh, press summary that's here, as well as uh, Tessa. If you can click over to the uh, overview page on uh, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, right? This is the one where yeah, it was pu that's published. It. That's so it. You can see the authors that are inside there. And of course, if you have access to these journals, you can read the full one. But in general, uh, you know, most people probably don't have access, but at least you can see the summary page that's there. Yeah. So how did you come up with the idea of what your hypothesis is based around? And how did you, what, how did you come up with it? What does it say? And how did you work with the people that you published this with, including some individuals you've mentioned who've been on this podcast, Dr. David Perlmutter, uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, uh, to stress test the idea to make sure that it was yes. robust enough to put out there to the community? Absolutely. So uh, let's begin, you know, where I started was by reading about Alzheimer's, <laughs> because obviously, you know, uh, it's such an important disease. It's a disease that has been, we believe it has been increasing in the last century. And you know, uh, I, the studies that I have been doing have been on things like obesity and diabetes. So, um, so just to, to talk about Alzheimer's just for a few minutes, we talked about the focus being on amyloid plaques and tau protein. And you know, in the very beginning, everyone said, well, maybe that's the cause of Alzheimer's, these plaques. And if we can figure out how to, to remove the plaques or to prevent the plaques, we can treat the disease. And so much of the focus of the pharma big pharma has been to try to develop ways to block that. And as you have already mentioned, you know, there's been like 40 different drugs that have gone to trial and only a few have succeeded and they only work partially at best. Um, and so people said, you know, there must be something that starts this, this whole disease. Let's, you know, let's go back to when the disease is just beginning. Can we actually identify, uh, you know, factors that seem to be important? And some of the factors that were important, were, you know, it's associated with diabetes and obesity, and these are diseases that I study. So I was interested in that. And it's also associated with insulin resistance in the brain. And they do these studies where they can show that there's an impairment 
of glucose uh, being taken up in the brain. If you do special scans, you can show that, uh, that there's an impairment in the ability for the brain to take up glucose. It's like the, glu it's like the brain is becoming insulin resistant. And, and if you wouldn't mind, we've done so many episodes on metabolic health, insulin resistance, why it's important to be insulin sensitive, but just give a little recap in the context, just in case somebody's watching this for the first time and they may not understand like, well, what does it mean to be insulin resistant inside of the brain? Okay, so, so you know, the brain uh, uses glucose as its primary fuel and it loves glucose. Glucose is the main carbohydrate that's uh, circulating in our blood. If our glucose levels are high, we, we call it diabetes. If the glucose levels are low, we call it hypoglycemia. But glucose is like the primary fuel and it's a major fuel the brain uses. And, um, but in early Alzheimer's, um, there seems to be an impairment in the neurons being able to utilize the glucose. There's like, uh, it, you know, so insulin is a hormone that takes, that helps drive glucose into cells. And if you become insulin resistant, you have trouble getting glucose into the into those cells. Most of a lot of the brain it doesn't require much insulin at all, and glucose can go in pretty easily. But there's certain regions of the brain that are insulin sensitive, and those parts of the brain, if you become insulin resistant, you can't deliver the fuel as well. And that's associated with the second problem that you see in Alzheimer's, which is the the mitochondria are these little factories in the cell that make energy, they make ATP. And uh, they, there seems to be some uh, problems with these energy factories in early Alzheimer's. They're not making as much ATP as they should. There uh, seems to be some stress going on with the mitochondria over time. There can be a loss of mitochondria. And so you have a problem with the energy factories, you have a problem with them taking up glucose to make energy and you have low grade inflammation. And I thought to myself, you know, this is actually what I study, but not in the brain, but what I'm studying in the circulation, what I'm studying in the systemic systems. You know, I, I'm looking at what drives insulin resistance and I have personally linked it with energy production and inability to for the these energy factories to make ATP and I thought oh my gosh there's a connection there and you know they were even you know some people call early Alzheimer's brain diabetes because of this insulin resistance you know and so I knew that there had to be some kind of link between those two diseases you know uh, between obesity and diabetes and uh, and and people who are obese and diabetic have an increased risk for developing it. But there seem to it what it isn't a match, you know. It isn't like if you're overweight, you're going to get to, you're going to get dementia. But but there is this uh, association, so a strong correlation, yeah, a correlation. Yeah. And and so I started thinking about you know what what our work shows in, in the body, and I started thinking about how that system might work on the brain, and I and I had this kind of Oh, aha moment mm. where I suddenly realized that I could explain how Alzheimer's develops. And so, um, That's uh, you know, it's a and hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. So everybody who's looking at me, <laughs> please, please don't, you know, it's not like I'm saying this is the cause, but what I would like to present you the evidence because it's very strong. Right. And one of the individuals, before we get to it, and this buildup is great because it's not just that we're trying to tease people before we get into it. We're actually trying to give you background knowledge of how you are showing your homework of how you arrive to this hypothesis right. because everything in science starts off as a hypothesis. Exactly. Right? And it's important for the audience to understand how you got there because even if the hypothesis is not 100% exactly true in the way that it's being presented, there are many instances where it could still be a big factor, the thing that we're going to get into that you think is deeply linked into, you know, that connection with Alzheimer's. And then with a lot of lifestyle and lifestyle factors and diet factors, there's things that we can do now where we could essentially play a little bit of a precautionary role in our life, right? Yes. If we find out that a food or an ingredient or a particular behavior that there's not a hundred percent consensus consensus about its link to a disease like Alzheimer's, but there does seem to be some strong links. We can say, okay, what are the pros and cons? Should we lower this ingredient in our life, right? Yes. Uh, should right. we maintain the amount that we're eating right now? Should we at least take a precautionary approach, 
because the argument is so strong and the downside is we might even get healthier. Yes, you know, if you If you follow some of the advice in this <laughs> podcast and yeah. what you're presenting inside of the paper with Dale Bredesen and, and David Perlmutter, you know, the downside, knock on wood, is that people are just going to get healthier. The upside is that we actually could potentially lower our risk of developing Alzheimer's. Yes. And I want to say one more thing. You know, the analogy that you gave about what's going on in the brain is very powerful. You know, not only is the fuel to the power plant being disrupted but the power plant itself is not working as efficiently. That's the mitochondria. Right. And on top of that, there's a fire at the power plant, which is this low-grade inflammation. So all these things are going on in the brain. It's going to be a recipe for disaster. And that's what exactly. you're painting out is going on for people as they're on their path and their way to Alzheimer's. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, just like currently, uh, you know, people, are, there are different groups that are saying, okay, they've got insulin resistance in the brain. How about if we give insulin through the nose, through the nostrils, where it can actually get to the brain directly? And can we treat the disease? Can we improve things? And there are early studies saying that might help a little bit. And there are people giving anti-inflammatories that can block the inflammation in the brain. They're seeing some, a little bit of protection. But the problem, Drew, with all these kinds of problems, of these approaches is they're trying to patch, they're trying to put out the fire, but they're not trying to figure out what's causing the fire. Yeah. And um, what's fantastic about this story that I'm gonna share with you is that it. There, I'm gonna try to show you how it happens and how we can prevent it. And at the, you know, at, at the end, let's talk about all the ways and the evidence that, that we can actually uh, re reverse or block early Alzheimer's and, and so forth, because it's a very exciting area. No, it's super exciting. And uh, so let's get into it. How do you want yeah. to start with the story? You know, you've been on the podcast previously. <laughs> yeah. You know, we have your book in front of you here, your yeah. last book that you wrote. It's called Nature Wants Us to Be Fat. And there's a little bit of a link yes. that's there because it goes back to your work into sort of our origin as humans and how certain adaptations that we had in our genetics to potentially... Uh, uh, adapt to the climate that was changing rapidly around us. Um, those adaptations helped us survive, but the byproduct is that those adaptations in our modern life, now that we're eating so much processed foods, those adaptations are being hijacked and they're causing us to be fat. You're absolutely right. So there, we, we have identified two mutations that have occurred in the past, both kind of interesting stories that make us more susceptible to obesity and diabetes, and at the same time may also have a role in increasing our risk for Alzheimer's. Huh. Um, and, and, but the, the fundamental issue is, is not just those mutations, but what is this pathway that's causing obesity and diabetes? So what I'd love to do is to take you through that part, and Let's then we can then hit the, you know, the mutations and these, you know, the survival pathway in the past as well. For sure. So, it's, an, it's an important part of the story and it builds up and they're both linked yes, together. This yeah, is they're kind of like the culmination together. of your work. So I was very interested in, in uh, what was causing obesity and diabetes. And, um, and through a series of adventures and research, uh, adventures related to doing different studies, we came to the, to the observation that uric acid was uh, very important in obesity and diabetes. And uric acid... Um, is a substance that circulates in our blood um, and uh, it's like a breakdown product of energy. So when energy breaks down, uh, energy is, we call energy ATP. Uh, and that's the, the what we use uh, to do everything we want. So the mitochondria, these energy factories produce ATP and the ATP is what gives us the energy. There's really two types of energy. There's the active energy, which is the ATP. That's for, you know, talking, running, jumping. And then there is stored energy. And stored energy is fat and, you know, can be carbohydrates too. But most of stored energy is fat. And so when a bear is hibernating and he's not eating and not getting the energy from food, he can use the stored energy or fat to produce the ATP he needs. So yeah, fat is a battery pack yes. that nature designed us to have. We think of it as being bad in modern times, but it was crucial in our survival because it meant energy. That's right. So uh, I became interested because we found that uric acid had a role in causing fat. 
and it had a role in raising blood pressure and causing things. So, you, you know, as I mentioned, uric acid is a substance circulating in our blood and it varies. And a lot of people have low levels and some people have very high levels of uric acid. And if the levels get really high, um, that can cause a disease called gout. And Which gout, a lot of people are familiar yeah, with as nine it's related people, to right. uric acid. That's yeah. how most people know about it. They That's might know right. that their parent or grandparent or somebody, you know, their uric acid levels were so high that they were like, oh, you're dealing with gout yeah. or that individual. Typically, what are the symptoms associated with gout? You know, people often hear yeah, about- Yeah, they get this joint pain. It's basically an inflammation of the joints. And so you get this red hot joint, You typically the big toe or the knee or the ankle, sometimes the wrist. And it's miserable. Uh, you know, it's very, very painful. It lasts a couple of weeks. Sometimes, uh, you know, you people take medication like uh, Advil and ibuprofen can help reduce the inflammation. Um, but it's, you know, it, although people used to think of gout as just being an arthritis, there's more and more evidence that it's not. And these uric acid crystals can also go to the kidneys and go to the blood vessels and about... There's recent studies that suggest that people with gout, that you know, that they have crystals in their aorta and their coronary arteries too. You know, uh, uh, the majority have some crystals in their blood vessels. It tends to go to the plaques uh, in the in the blood vessels, mm. and so um, so so gout is not just an arthritis, and and it's been known for a long time that gout is also associated with obesity and diabetes and um, and hypertension and, and kidney disease. And so uh, I- Which had, is also why, for, sorry to interrupt, yeah. for a long time, people would call it the rich man's disease. Exactly. Right? Because it was associated with excess and especially in our you know, society, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, where an obesity rates were a lot lower, they did see gout primarily in individuals that had access to extra calories, yes. which also included alcohol, alcohol. And that's why they sweet would typically wines. sweet wines, things like that. They would typically that's right, you know, tell those individuals to avoid those types of foods if they were dealing with gout. So anyway, so f for a long time, people, uh, you know, linked gout with you know being a rich man's disease, also with being o overweight, obese, hypertensive, all these conditions. Uh, it's about uh, seventy percent of people with gout are overweight. I mean, it's like a very strong association. Sixty or seventy percent are. Are, are diabetic. I mean, it's a, a very strong link. And people were saying for years, thought, you know, um, hypertension and diabetes and obesity increase your risk for, for gout. But actually, the high uric acid usually precedes the development of obesity. It precedes the development of diabetes. It precedes the development of kidney disease. It's one of the earliest markers that predicts the development of these conditions. It's a very strong predictor. And uh, when we were studying it, we realized that uric acid doesn't just form crystals and cause inflammation. Uric acid is biologically active. And one of its main things that it does is it in, acts on mitochondria, those little energy factories, and it causes stress to them and reduces their energy production. Mm. So think about that. Okay. So anyway, so I was studying uric acid and that took me to uh, you know, what, uh, we had this evidence that it was driving blood pressure, uh, and might have a cause in hypertension. And, uh, and we did this study actually in adolescents who are overweight, where we lowered uric acid in them and their blood pressure corrected it. And we published it in the JAMA. It was, you know, a big deal. And that was done through medical intervention? Um, yeah. It was, we just, low, yeah, we used the drug to lower the uric acid and a ninety percent of them or so became normal tensive. It, wow. it was it was uh, and, amazing. And by the and they way, they that, never got they never received a blood pressure pill. And that's your area of expertise, right? Right. That's your background, right. As a kidney doctor, that's and right. That's, that's really your bread and butter of what you yes. studied in your in your career. So then the question was, what drives the uric acid up? And you know, most people think of alcohol and actually things like red meats, but actually one of the major things that raises uric acid is fructose and sugar. And uh, and so actually Gary Tovs, uh, who I'm sure you know, uh, was, interviewed me related to a paper that came, that uh, was published in the New England Journal on, on gout and its relationship with, uh, you know, with diet. 
And uh, when we were talking on the phone, he says, well, what do you think about sugar as a driver of, of uric acid? And I said, well, it's definitely is a driver. It's the fructose component. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and, and, you know, after I had my conversation with him, I went home and I thought, you know, uh, we should give fructose to animals and see uh, if they develop high blood pressure. And if we lower the uric acid, can we lower the blood pressure? Because at this point I was focused on blood pressure. And so what happened was, uh, you know, uh, some people in my lab, Taka Nakagawa, we gave fructose to animals and they became hypertensive. Uh, and so fructose is that component of sugar. So table sugar or sucrose um, has is half fructose and half glucose. And there's another sweetener, high fructose corn syrup. It's also about half and half fructose and glucose. But fructose is the only sugar that raises uric acid. Mm. And so we gave fructose to animals and they became hypertensive. The we, blood pressure was high. Yeah, the blood pressure went up just like this. And we gave the drug to lower the uric acid and the blood pressure came down. But there was a big surprise because the animals that got fructose also started getting fat and they started developing insulin resistance. And they, you know, they, they're, uh, fats went up in their blood, the fat went up in their liver. I mean, they were developing obesity and metabolic syndrome right in front of us. And when we lowered the uric acid, we actually could reduce all of those. And I go, oh, it can't be. It can't be just lowering the blood pressure, and all, but also lowering all these other things. And then we started realizing this was that fructose was, first off, it was a very potent driver of obesity. But the other thing is we could lessen it by lowering uric acid. And the cool part is uric acid's not in the caloric pathway, you know, so there's calories, you know, everyone says it's calories, but calories are the, yes, say say the calories are the big driver of obesity. Right. But uric acid was being produced independently of the of calories. calories. And when we block that part, we actually were blocking, uh, you know, the, the obesity. And, and then we said, well, what's driving it? And we started doing a million studies. And what we realized is that fructose actually makes animals obese by uh, affecting their appetite. Basically, it induces, um, it blocks the ability to, uh, to feel full. And so animals will keep eating. Uh, you know, a lot. I mean, they eventually stop eating, but they eat a lot more than they're supposed to. And, and it turns out that they become resistant to a harm, hormone called leptin. And when they become leptin resistant, they can, they'll eat and eat. Now, if you give them just fructose, they don't gain that much weight because the fructose is only four calories per gram. High, you know, fat is nine calories per gram. So if you give, if you make them so they're hungry, and then you give them that fatty food, then they if get they have fat. access yeah, to other yeah, sources of other, concentrated yeah. calories. Right. Then they get super fat. So the fat, we could show that the fat was really important for the weight gain. But if you just gave the animal fat, they didn't gain as much weight. It was much, much less. They ate the food. They felt the signal of leptin, which said I'm full yeah. or I'm not they, as hungry. And so they didn't overeat. But if they had fructose, that's they right. couldn't sense that signal that's leptin. Right. And so they kept on eating if they, in right. particular, had access yes. to highly concentrated calories in the form of fat. Yeah. And we even did an experiment where we gave fructose to make them leptin resistant. And then we stopped the fructose and they stay leptin resistant for several weeks, like two or three weeks. And then if you put them on a high fat diet, they gain a lot more weight with a high fat diet than they would with just a regular high fat diet. So the, so the leptin resistance could carry over. So if you st stop the sugar and you think that you're you're good for at least a couple of weeks, you can stay leptin resistant. Got it. So there's a little bit of time that it took. Yeah, both before it went away. Both for animals, but probably as you're theorizing for human beings too, right. that if you are used to, and your body's used to eating a lot of fructose, we'll talk about the top sources of fructose yeah. in a second in our modern diet, then you could end up in a place and position where even if you pull back from those foods, you still have the urge to overeat. Right. And then what we did is we studied this. We found that the way fructose works is uh, it's unique from all other calories, from all other foods. It's the only food that drops the ATP in the cell. Mm. And, it's, and the way it works 
is how you can say, well, how does if Which you're giving if you're production. giving if you're giving fructose, the calories should increase the ATP, you would say. Except remember there's two sources of energy. There's two energies. There's the ATP, which is the active energy, and then there's the stored energy. Together they equal the total energy. Mm. So when you eat normally when you eat calories, you know, you try to keep your ATP levels high. You want the gas tank full. You don't want the ATP level to fall. If it does, it's like an alarm signal, you know, gas tank, you know, you, you know. Running on empty. We're running getting close on to empty, it. close to empty. So normally we try to keep our ATP full. And then if there's extra energy, it goes into the fat. The fat is kind of the backup. It's like the, the luggage, you know, but you want that, the, the, the gas tank full. What fructose does is it lowers the ATP level by block, by acting on the mitochondria. It reduces the, it stuns the mitochondria so they don't make as much ATP. It's almost like a little bit of poison for the yes, mitochondria. It, it, yeah, it does. It's it's oxidative stress to the mitochondria. It, and it's very specific and it knocks out different aspects of it. And the result is that there's less ATP in the cell. And instead the energy gets shunted to the fat, energy balance is maintained. You know, if you're eating energy, you know, calories are a type of energy. You, you, it will, you, you will either burn it or or store it and it gets stored here, but you, you keep the ATP levels low. So what happens is the body thinks it's starving. Mm. It's so, because it feels like there's not enough energy. So you keep eating. And then eventually the ATP levels recover when you, so when you have a soft drink, you know, there's this, there's this uh, period of time where the ATP level falls. You can measure it by using special NMR and things like that. You can actually measure the ATP like in your liver after drinking a soft drink and it plummets. A traditional soft drink, one of the big brands that yes, is yes. sweetened with high yes, fructose yes, corn syrup. Yes, high fructose corn syrup for sugar. And, and and so it's the fructose that does it. So when we started studying this, we go, oh my gosh, uh, obesity is also a low energy state. If you biopsy the liver or the muscle, the ATP levels are low. And if you biopsy, uh, you know, the uh, in diabetes, if you, if you, you know, look at the tissues, the ATP levels are low. All these are low energy states and yet everybody's eating more. Right, they're having so many calories. Yes. So you're thinking, why is this person- Their in a total low energy is energy, high because it's all stored It's fat. all being stored and something's signaling to the body, right. don't use this energy, right. but actually store this energy. And that goes back to this idea of uric acid and yes. fructose yes. being a poison to the mitochondria. Yes. And, you know, and so it turns out that, you know, a lot of people were thinking of obesity as you cap off the tank and the extra goes into fat. But actually the trick is to drop the ATP to make you eat more and to shunt the energy to fat. So zooming out for just a second here to provide it in context, because we've had all sorts of different people on the podcast before that our audience has heard from. Some people in the traditional energy balance world, which is really all about calories in and calories out. If we want people to lose weight, we just need to lower their total calories, right? And there is a lot of truth to that. There yes. is energy balance inside of the body. Yes, right? this is still an energy balance. There's equation. still an energy balance component. And yes, if you do, you know, if you're eating excess calories than what your body can handle, then you're going to end up gaining weight that's there. Now, another side of it is the side that says, look, calories are important, but they're not the only thing. There's other pathways that are at play. And you're describing one of the pathways that we know is established in animals. Yes. Is it established in humans as well? I think so. So so let's just go through this again. So, so like the energy balance people say that it's mainly fat is the main thing that's driving weight gain. And, you know, if because you do, it because it's the highest density of calories. Right. And if you're going to do a short-term study and you do carb restriction or fat restriction, you might actually lose more weight by doing fat restriction. And the low carb people say, wait a second, if you go on a low carb diet, you, you don't even have to, you know, you're, you're, uh, you don't even have to restrict calories. You're going to lose weight. Right. And it's just, and, and the both are right. They're both and, right. And it turns, and I actually, I've submitted a paper 
it's under review that unites all these different hypotheses because this work that I'm talking about actually does unite these pathways. So for example, if you go on a low carb diet, after a couple of weeks, you're gonna become leptin sensitive. And, and so you're gonna really control, you know, you're gonna, uh, you, you're not gonna be gaining weight despite being on a high fat diet. So a low carb diet is often high fat, yet you're not gaining weight. That This doesn't match with the energy balance people who say, well, if you go on a high fat diet, you should really gain weight because it's got the most calories. And one clarification about that. Som sometimes the energy balance folks say, well, you're still eating less calories. And then the people on the other side say, there's two different camps. There's one camp that says, well, calories don't matter. You can even be eating a lot more calories and not gain as much weight. And then there's the other side that says, well, you just don't crave as much calories, right? So yeah. you're not, because you're you're more likely to connect in because you're leptin sensitive. You're like, okay, I got it. My brain got it. I'm full. I don't need to eat anymore. That's, yes, that, that's the key. So that's the key. you become leptin sensitive when you go on a low carb diet. So you, you're going to fill up much quicker. You, 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 and if you're leptin resistant, you're going to keep eating a lot. But what drives calories, you know, is really, it's the, the fatty foods have a lot more calories. So it's really easy to gain weight uh, if you are leptin resistant, you know, with, with, high f with fatty foods. So, Especially so like, in our world of ultra yes, processed foods, yes, yes. where you have the perfect combination of yes. often, you know, high carb, high fat, yes, yes, sugar, salty, it's all the things together, makes it super easy for people to gain weight. So what we, what we did is we gave fructose and we could make animals obese. They developed all features of metabolic syndrome, you know, insulin resistance and all these things. And we realized it was a survival system for them because uh, they're, they're, they're thinking that, you know, that they're in a low energy state. So storing fat will help them, you know, it's, it's like what the bear does before it hibernates. So it will eat all this f huge amounts of fruit, which has fructose, to help increase their fat stores so that they can make it through winter. They become insulin resistant so that the blood levels of glucose are high so that those areas of the brain that are not insulin sensitive can, can get fuel uh, preferentially over the muscle where the muscle, insulin resistance in the muscle reduces the glucose uptake in the muscle. So when you're insulin resistant, uh, what happens is the muscle becomes resistant to the effects of insulin in particular, and they use less glucose. So the glucose levels go up in the brain and there's more glucose for the brain. So it actually, you know, if you're starving, you want your brain to get the fuel more than anywhere else. So. So insulin resistance can be a benefit to the brain acutely because it, it re removes the glucose from going into the muscle to rather to, to be provided for the brain, for those areas of the brain that don't require insulin. Yeah. And just to go back to your bear example, you know, I shared this previously, but I went up to a uh, uh, national park up in uh, Montana Yeah, and it was right before they were about to close the season out because of snow and everything, you know, coming in. And uh, Glacier National Park, yep. uh, which also shares a uh, border with Canada, and it's called something else inside of Canada. And I hired a guy to kind of take me down some, you know, back pathways yeah. and things. She was like, oh, let's go down this pathway. You can eat some wild berries that are like safe for humans and stuff. We got there and like the bushes were decimated. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess the berries aren't around this season. She's like, no, the bears all came in. And they gorge themselves. They'll eat hundreds of pounds of berries. They do. To gear up because their body is signaling that it's time to get ready for hibernation. So they're eating all this berries, which is fruit, which is fructose. Yes. Right? And and then what that does is that makes them leptin resistant. And then they eat more and more. They can get eight to 10 pounds a day, a day. And uh, then they use that and they become fat. And then they hibernate and they live off their fat for the entire winter, you know? And so right. that's what they do. So when we were studying fructose, we go, oh gosh, this was actually used as a survival pathway to, to help store fat and to help the animal raise blood pressure because it thinks that there's no food around. So this is always, this is a good thing for the animal, but it's temporary, right? Uh, but we are eating all this fructose all the time. We're eating sugar, uh, you know, so many, 70% of processed foods have sugar or high fructose corn syrup. 
uh, maybe 15, 20% of our diet, of the average diet is fructose, uh, high fructose corn syrup or sugar. So we're, we're inundating us. And so this seemed to be the, one of the problems. And then when we looked at, you know, how this works, is it calories or not? What we, we found was that calories drives weight gain because, you know, if we uh, gave all the, if we treated animals with a fructose diet versus like a starch diet, what we or or a control diet, the fructose animals and the control animals, if they all ate the same number of calories, the the fructose animals were hungry, but they couldn't eat anymore because there was no food given to them because we could restricted it. So their weight. You, do, you were doing meal feeding yeah, for the rodents. Yeah, pair, pair feeding. So yeah. each animal got the same as the other. So what happens is the fructose fed animals actually got hungry, but they couldn't eat anymore. And so weight gain didn't go up because weight gain is really an energy balance equation. But everything else did happen. They became diabetic. They became hypertensive. They got the fatty Crazy. liver. Whereas the control animals didn't. So what we learned is that there's two things. You know, fructose doesn't require extra calories to make you to make your liver fat. Mm. Doesn't require extra calories to uh, make your blood pressure go up. It doesn't require extra calories to make you insulin resistant. You can become diabetic on a diet. We even made animals diabetic, restricting their calories, but keeping it as a high sugar diet. Mm. So, so most of the features of metabolic syndrome are not driven by excess calories. They're driven by fructose. But the, uh, the rest of it, you know, weight gain is an energy balance. If I, I restrict calories, your weight's gonna go down, uh, you know, it's, it's so if we were theoretically, obviously this would you, you couldn't do this, but if you theoretically were able to have and control a diet for human beings where they had a limited amount of calories that was their maintenance level for what their energy output right. and everything was, their height, weight, you know, gender, but you increase their fructose to the levels that we're seeing today. And I was looking at a few different studies and even in like the late 1990s, because, you know, it's, it's tough because they were doing this based off of survey data. Even since then, it seems like our fructose up, uh, intake has skyrocketed. Right. Back then they were estimating, you know, on average, you know, 10 to 12% maybe. Now, you know, we're hearing numbers that are more like what you're sharing based on the latest data, yeah. which it could be 15 to 20% and more of people's diets could be coming from sources that include fructose. So if you kept their calories low, Sure, you could see these humans in this theoretical lab, right, which, which would be unethical, but just theorizing, you would see them and their weight wouldn't be increasing, but they would have, if you looked at their blood work or their metabolic yeah. health, everything, you would see that they have either diabetes or their blood work would be yeah, a mess. Like, like we did a study in dialysis patients and we found fatty liver to be very high in some of them, even though they were skinny, but they were a lot of them were eating sugar and they had high uric acid. And there's actually a thing called lean fatty. You know, you can be lean and have fatty skinny liver. Fat. Yes. This skin. happens to a lot. I'm very yeah. well familiar with it because it happens to a lot of South Asians, yeah. Indians yeah. here in America. Yeah. And it's a big problem. Yeah. They tend to have desk jobs. They tend to not work out that often, especially, but, you know, older population. They're having a lot of sources of sugar that are in their but, diet. Yeah, but they're, yeah, exactly. They're eating the wrong food, but they're trying to control how much they eat. They're eating the wrong food, but they have some resources, in particular in America, that population is actually the highest income earning per right. any ethnic minority. So there's a lot of resources. Right. There's generally good health care. A lot of them are doctors themselves. Yeah. So they're controlling their food. They're trying to watch it, but they still have a lot of sugar. So they end up. Yep. Thin on the outside, fat on the inside. That's absolutely correct. And then, you know, so, so the, you know, we had this insight. This was, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago that, that fructose could drive metabolic syndrome. And it did it through this, this one system was through uric acid and did not actually uh, require excess calories, but the actual weight gain did. And then we had, you know, so that we were at that point, we had another big discovery, which is going to be very important for the Alzheimer's story. Please. And, and what we, we, we realize is that um, we, the body can make fructose as well. This was kind of a big surprise. Um, you know, it was known that the body can make fructose and diabetes. So uh, there, it was all had already been published that 
in diabetes, when blood glucose levels go very up, go up, that they can, some of the glucose can be converted to fructose. And so you can take a person who's like in diabetic ketoacidosis um, and they've not been eating and their, but their blood sugars are high. They have high fructose levels too. Mm. Cause when the blood glucose goes up, that triggers a reaction to convert some of the glucose to fructose. Wow. And do you and, think that that's also just, just to contextualize it for our audience. So if somebody was measuring their blood sugar, which typically if you get blood work done, or these days, if people have a continuous glucose monitor, they can yeah. also see it that way. And they could see that their glucose levels are high, for example, if they are high. And let's say you start to get into that pre-diabetic range where if your blood sugar is above, what is it usually, like 100 or 110 yeah. around there, if it stays at that level, that's when people start to get really worried. Doctors in particular are like, hey, listen, you're in that pre-diabetic range. So do you think that there was an evolutionary reason why the body was designed to take excess free-floating glucose that's around and turning it into fructose. Like what's the reason that the body would be doing that? Yeah. Well, there are several potential reasons for it. So um, so the the one one reason is is that when glucose levels go up in the blood, we people start getting dehydrated. Mm. And um, and what happens is it it stimulates water loss through the urine. You you people with high glucose levels will pee. But they also, the glucose itself, uh, it sort of thickens the blood with material. I mean, the glucose actually increases what we call osmolality. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's a, how many molecules are in the blood. And as the concentration goes up, there's less water. So as salt concentrations go up in the blood or glucose concentrations go up in the blood, um, we tend to get dehydrated. So when blood glucose levels go up, we'll get thirsty. And it's like we need water. And uh, it turns out that fructose, um, that, that fat actually can be a source of water. And when fructose is making fat, it isn't just for calories, it's for water. So when the bear hibernates and he's not drinking uh, water, when he burns the fat during the winter, he's actually generating water. Which is how the and, bear can survive. And, you're right. And, and like a lot of animals, like whales, have fat and they will actually burn the fat to provide water. About a third of the water they get, of the fresh water they get, comes from fat. And they don't drink seawater because it's too salty. So they get their, most of their water from the food they eat, mm. but they actually use their fat to produce water. And animals in the desert like the camel and stuff has this hump of fat, which it uses to produce water when it needs it. So, uh, but, so it turns out that severe when you're severely dehydrated, you'll start breaking down fat as a source of water. And when you're just very, very mildly dehydrated, you actually wanna make fat. It's like a signal to make fat to, to provide another source of water. Mm. And so, um, Which when you're, you're is linked to yes. the pursuit of wanting to eat. Yeah. So when we, what happened was we, we had this discovery. What, what we, we knew that sugar and high fructose corn syrup, syrup could drive obesity. But the question was, you know, what about other foods? And one of them was carbs. And, um, and we realized that when you eat carbs, the glucose level goes up in the blood and uh, and that that maybe it could be just like diabetes. If the glucose levels go up, could some of it being converted over to, to fructose? So what we did is we fed animals a high glycemic diet, sort of like rice, potatoes, bread. You know, these are starches, the starchy foods, because they they contain glucose. And when you break down rice and potatoes and French fries and things like that, you produce uh, glucose. And if the glucose levels are high, we already knew that that could convert to fructose. And we had this big discovery that when we fed animals glucose, they also over time developed metabolic syndrome. They got obese and everything, just like fructose. But when we, we looked in their, in their tissues, we found that they were producing fructose. And when we blocked fructose by using a genetically a mouse that can't metabolize fructose. We, we genetically made a mouse that cannot metabolize fructose. And if we gave it glucose, it became, you know, it gained a little bit of weight through that insulin pathway, but basically it didn't gain much weight. 
And so what happened was it became, was protected from developing diabetes, uh, hypertension, all these different things. And it turned- If it could block fructose. Yeah, if we block fructose. So then we had this discovery that actually the way carbs work is a lot of the, you know, carbs do stimulate insulin. Insulin does stimulate fat to some extent. That's absolutely true. But there was another mechanism that people didn't know about, which is that when you eat carbs and glucose, bread, and uh, you, you actually convert that to fructose, and then the fructose drives obesity. Yeah. And just to take a pause, you know, as our audience is listening to us, you know, we're going to get into recommendations, extrapolations, other stuff right. that's there. It's not that you are demonizing carbs. You're no. talking about super high carbohydrate yes, diets. Exactly. When an animal, in this case, you're talking about mice, but we can extrapolate some of that to human beings as well or theorize that if we are eating a lot of carbs, potentially, again, you got to say potentially because we don't have the big studies right. that are there. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think yeah. that's accurate. But yeah. but we can at least theorize then it could be causing some of, it could be activating some of the same pathways in human beings. That's right. So, it, it, you know, so we realized that, you know, carbs could be converted to fructose and it has been shown in people like, uh, there's already several studies showing that if you eat carbs, you can convert it to fructose in the body. When that's the glucose, established in, in humans. That's been established in humans, yes. So there, that, there's already studies showing that. Yes. Um, the big question is how much, but we definitely are doing it. Right. And, um, and one study suggests that you, you can make like the equivalent of a soft drink of, of fructose, you know, like 20, 25 grams of fructose a day we produce per, likely. If we are eating a higher carbohydrate diet. Yeah, and diet. it probably could be even more. But right. Yeah. So, yeah, sometimes people argue and they say, well, I'm not having as much fructose. I'm not drinking yeah. high fructose, you know, right. corn syrup. I'm not drinking exactly. sodas and things like that. Yeah. yeah so, so as I mentioned, like 15% of our diet is coming from table sugar, or high fructose corn syrup, of which at least half of that is fructose, right? Yeah. Um, and that seems to be a big play, but there are a lot of people who are not eating so much of the sugar, but they still can get fat from carbs. And we think that that is because the carbs are not just stimulating insulin, but the carbs are being converted to fructose. And when you have a glucose monitor and you, your glucose level, you eat a, a, you know, a hamburger or something and you're the, with the bun and everything and the glucose goes up to 140, you're probably making some fructose. Some fructose, which is it, why because we because we know that there's a big connection when people go and measure their fasting insulin. Right. Right. We know that keeping your fasting insulin in an optimal range. Right. Right. Is generally associated with people being healthier, less obese, um, and 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 not developing diabetes, right. et cetera. Right. Right. So yeah. that we know. And generally, the same way that you're talking about uric acid as a precursor, a pre-indicator of obesity later on, like your uric yeah. acid has to be stimulated and high. We'll get to those numbers in a little bit. Yeah. And then that signals to the body to sort of through multiple pathways that you right. explained earlier to, you know, start gaining weight in that same way, glucose, you know, your glucose varies throughout the day. Right. It's always in real time. It's varying, but your fasting insulin, it takes a little while to sort of change that. It's not, uh, it's, you know, generally from us being able to look at it on blood work, it's not going up and down the way that glucose is going. Right. But when your glucose, from what I understand from the experts that are out there like yourself, if you're constantly spiking your blood glucose and your average is high, that's going to drive your insulin up. And we already know that fasting insulin and our insulin is associated right. with all these chronic diseases that are out there. Right. But fructose does, you know, so glucose stimulates insulin when, when glucose levels go up, insulin goes up. But what fructose will do is over time, it will increase the insulin even without the glucose having to go up. Mm. It, it actually induces insulin resistance. So fructose actually is what's driving insulin resistance. Glucose is driving insulin, but it's not insulin resistance. It's just a normal parallel. Glucose goes up, insulin goes up, glucose has moved into this tissue. Some of it gets turned to fat. But once you become insulin resistant, you're you're actually going into a low ATP state. And that is really what fructose does. And it's really in two pathways that it's doing that. One pathway is that it's some of it's being converted to glucose, right? But then you're saying that it's the the part that is damaging. 
Yes. The ATP, that's the yeah. poison for ATP. Yes, so, and, and it's through that uric acid pathway. Uric acid pathway. That seems to be really Because important. when the mitochondria is poisoned through this fructose, and that's my word, not yours, but it's like when it's being harmed- It's poisoned. It's poisoned, so it's being damaged. The mitochondria is the power cells, the factory inside of our right. cells. It's not working as well, so it can't receive insulin and it's saying, no, 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 no. And that's insulin resistance. Like don't put any more insulin in this cell. We have no more room for it. So now that insulin is flowing through the bloodstream, which can have an inflammatory effect on the body. That's right. So, so what we, what we figured out was it's not so much the insulin resistance causes inflammation. It's that fructose is driving a series of events to help the animal survive acutely. You know, it's stimulating inflammation to help fight off infection. It's raising blood pressure to maintain circulation in a state where it thinks it doesn't, you know, that it's maybe starving. It's, it, it increases pressure in the kidneys to facilitate excretion of the kit, you know, stuff from the, through the kidneys. It, you know, causes insulin resistance, which is to help preserve some, some glucose in the blood for the tissues that need it. You know, it it moves, makes fat, but it blocks the breaking down of fat. And so it's it's stimulating all of these at once. And it's all working by through the mitochondria. And there's specific chemical pathways that are driving each one that we've been studying. So we we can actually show that, you know, how the insulin resistance develops, how, you know, how, why you can't break down the fat. It's all driven through this this particular chemistry. And then we realized that fructose is really the, uh, was meant to help us store energy and prepare us for, for, you know, times when there's no food around. Like winter. Yes. Whereas glucose is there for the immediate fuel. And then glucose is like trying to raise the ATP in the cell. Fructose is trying to get us to store fat. And the way it does it is it drops, it stuns the mitochondria, drops that ADP and activates all those pathways. And that was the fundamental discovery. We go, oh my gosh, this is super important in evolution and biology. Glucose is really meant, has a different role than fructose. And then we realized though, that if you eat too much glucose, it gets turned over into fructose. And we found out that very mild dehydration could also stimulate fructose production because fructose helps the animal store water by generating fat. And then the, we realized that the best way to create an animal to cause mild dehydration was to eat salt. And then we started doing studies with salt and we realized that when you eat salt and, the, and you get thirsty, you're actually stimulating fructose production from glucose. So salt activates the chemical reaction that converts glucose to fructose. So you've got two things that are important for making fructose. One is you gotta have glucose around. So if you're on a low carb diet, you're in good shape because you're, you're not gonna have so much glucose around because all glucose comes from, you know, the main source of, of glucose in our body comes from the carbs. You can make glucose from amino acids and so forth, but it's not very much. And so most of the glucose that we get in our body comes from the carbs we eat. So if you're on a low carb diet, you're not gonna make very much fructose. So that's why low carb diets are so fantastic because they not only are they reducing sugar intake, but they're reducing carb intake that will reduce the amount of fructose you make. But salt is, is a very powerful way of converting glucose to fructose. And that's why French fries, for example, are so, they cause so much obesity and are so bad because you've got the carbs, you've got that starch, the potato, and then you got it coated with salt, make it taste really good. And that salt activates the conversion of the carb to fructose, the glucose to fructose. And then you coat it with the fat and now you've got the fat. You got the trifecta. Yeah, you, you got the trifecta, so boom. So- uh, and, and just and just again, in the context of it, because you know the, the, right now, even though you're talking about these different pathways and how these different uh, either ingredients or macronutrients play a role in this, you're not totally demonizing salt. You're not right. totally demonizing right. carbs. You're not demonizing anything. Right. We're talking about what happens when, unfortunately in America, we're eating these highly processed yes. foods, right? And just even if people were not eating the level of 
highly processed foods, right. that alone, like if you're following along with this, like that alone, even though there's more to it, there's more to it than, 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 than just this, that immediately is going to start to pull you in a direction where you're not activating these pathways as much. You're totally right. Yeah. I still eat cake on my birthday, you know, uh, you know, I'll eat salt, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have salty food occasionally. Uh, it, it's not that you, you know, that we want to eliminate these foods in any way. But what we want to do is, is to be aware that they can convert to fructose. And if we're doing a lot of it, we're going to generate a lot of fructose in our body and we're going to eat a lot of fructose if we eat sugary foods. So we, you know, we want to cut it back. We want to reduce it. If you want, if you can get rid of it, you know, soft drinks, that's a good move. You know, soft drinks don't do anything. Right now that's really... the biggest concentration of fructose. Yes. Right. Especially if it's not, you know, Right. That may have its own challenges, but especially if it's not like a diet soda or right. something like that. That's right. And natural fruit turns out to be much healthier than we think. You know, if you're a bear and you're eating 10,000 grapes, you're going to get you're going to get fat if you eat 10,000 grapes. OK, but, you know, uh, when you eat a natural fruit, it's only three or four grams of fructose typically in a fruit. And um, my friend Josh Rabinovich showed that uh, the intestine inactivates about three to four grams of fructose. So you can eat a natural fruit and you won't get any fructose to your liver, you know, because it's all removed by the intestine. And it's really in the liver where the where it controls this metabolic syndrome. And so uh, so if you just eat occasional fruit, you know, you're going to get all the good things in the fruit. Phytonutrients. Yeah. Vitamin C. Fiber. Potassium, fiber, and all these things are good. And actually vitamin C and uh, and flavanols and all these things, potassium, they actually counter the effects of fructose. So we actually did studies where we put animals or people on a low fructose diet and we supplemented them with natural fruits. So they, they were getting back fructose but only in the form of fruit, not in the form of refined sugars. And they, they lost weight and, you know, they did well, just as well as the people who, who did not get the natural fruit supplements. Right. So it's all about the context. Right. And again, when you're eating fruit in its whole form. Yes. We'll get to fruit juice. Yeah. Fruit juice next. isn't good. Yeah. <laughs> fruit juice, which could have some of the same problems that, yeah. you know, high fructose corn syrup, soft drinks. Yes. Have. Talk about that. Yeah. So fruit juice. And, and by the yeah. way, just for everybody who's listening, we're about to get right back into all. Yeah, we're going to get there. Establish exactly. We got to establish a little bit of the groundwork. That's, that's right. So, so fruit juice. So fruit juice is is you, where you take multiple fruit, you juice it, you get rid of some of the pulp and the fiber, and you end up with a a drink that often has like three or four fruits in it. And so the, it, instead of having three or four grams of fructose, now it can have maybe you have twenty. 20 grams of fructose. And now it's similar to like a fruit, like a soft drink and, you know, apple juice. I love apple juice, but it's not good for you because there's a lot of sugar in it, a lot of fructose, and it will trigger the switch. Um, it will trigger this, con this activation. So, um, so I don't recommend fruit juice. So anyway, so, you know, the first discovery was that fructose was dif different from glucose or from other foods, that it really dropped the energy in the cell and that this uh, and that this activated an alarm signal that triggered metabolic syndrome. The second discovery, though, was that there are other ways you can make fructose, you can make fructose, and some of them are from high glycemic carbs and salty foods. And uh, and then we realized that if you ate a lot of those foods, you could get into trouble, too. And so but it all related to fructose because if we blocked fructose metabolism, animals could eat salt and they wouldn't get fat. They would, they could eat salty foods. They could eat processed foods, you know, but, um, and so it turned out to be fructose. And so then I, you know, we began to realize that it wasn't just activating the metabolic syndrome. It was also, it, it had these neural effects so like the brain effects. So when you when animals start eating fructose, they actually start to forage for food. And um, and that foraging is part of the survival response. So it actually, if you give fructose to an animal, it will start moving around and looking for food. Um, they're hungry, they get thirsty, uh, and, and it triggers a foraging response. And it was uh, that information start, made me start thinking more about what was going on in the brain. How is fructose affecting the brain? And I, we, we knew that if you, if you give fructose to an animal, 
or to a human and you label the fructose, only about 1% of it gets to the brain. So it, there had to be another mechanism. And the insight was that, uh, that when you take these high glycemic foods or soft drinks, they stimulate fructose production in many sites, including in other tissues. And so they, they stimulate fructose production in the brain. And there is a brilliant doctor named Sherwin at Yale uh, who did these studies where he infused glucose in people and he could measure fructose production going up in the brain mm. of people. And it happens like after about an hour. So if you infuse glucose, it takes a little while for that conversion to occur. But you can start measuring an increase in fructose in the brain. How, how do you get glucose directly into the brain? Like, what was he doing? He was well. No, he was he was giving it intravenously. Okay, so, so it still has to so, go through the brain. Yeah, so blood once they, exactly, sir. Once and he brought the the blood glucose up. And when the blood glucose goes up, we know it can, can converts to fructose. Right. But it will convert. T tissues will start making fructose wherever that glucose hits. So that glucose is going to the brain. But now because there's excess glucose, the tissues potentially in the brain right. are now activating and creating fructose. And already you've shared with us that fructose is one of the ways that we end up poisoning the mitochondria right. in the cells. Right. And it also can induce insulin resistance. So now I'm going to tell you insulin so resistance. Yeah, so now I'm going to tell you this this story of, of how we started putting together Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. Let's talk about it. So the first thing is uh, I, I, you look at what are the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and, you know, dietary ones, guess what they are? Eating sugar. Sugary foods has been reported to be a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's. Eating high glycemic carbs, they make fructose, right? A risk factor. Salty foods, there are all these papers showing that High salt diets increase the risk for Alzheimer's. Right. And just just one one context. We mentioned this last time, but the vast majority of salt in people's diets today is coming from pre-processed Process. foods. Right. In fact, the biggest one was breads and rolls. We're not talking about the sea salt that you add to broccoli, the sea salt that right. you might put in right. a little bit of dressing. It's the ultra processed It's the foods. ultra processed foods, which have more sodium than you would never put that much amount of sodium in it, but they've been designed to be super salty and kind of hidden with sweetness yeah. and fat. What the, sometimes they do is like they take these little shrimp and they'll inject them with salt water. Saline water, right. Yeah, and then what that does is it makes the shrimp big, looks big. Same thing with chicken. They'll do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And then people go into the market and they see these big shrimp and they go, oh, they look good. And they bring them home and then they start grilling them and then the water comes out and they shrink. <laughs> right, right. Little, but they, they keep that salt in there. So. They keep that salt inside so, of there. So now you're getting the salt. Yes, processed foods. Processed food, not uh, sea salt that they we're contain, adding contain. They contain food. so much salt, so much sugar, and they're associated with Alzheimer's too. Right. Processed foods are an ink. Bread rolls, pasta sauce, yeah, yeah, yeah. all these all things. All these things. Right. All these things we get in the grocery store. So, so first off, there's this association of foods that can make fructose or that contain fructose correlate, you know, and I don't mean natural fruits. I mean like soft drinks and fruit juice. You know, these things are associated with Alzheimer's. Concentrated forms yeah. of Obesity fructose. is associated with Alzheimer's, diabetes is, and these are conditions associated with, you know, that we think fructose is driving. Okay. So then, so that's the first thing is there's this association. Then the second thing is that if you, give sugar to an animal uh, after a number of weeks, they actually have trouble, uh, you know, going through a maze. So normally you can, you can measure how long it takes for uh, a lab mouse to get through a maze. And each time it, it will get a little bit smarter and it will shorten the amount of time to get through it. But if you feed it sugar, it doesn't, show that shortening that it continues to have trouble all the time getting mm. through the maze. And uh, when you, when you give the sugar to the animal uh, and you look in the brain, guess what you find? You find suppression of the mitochondria with less, you know, there's, there's oxidative stress to the mitochondria, which we know happens in other tissues with fructose. And it's associated with lo lower ATP production, low grade inflammation, and insulin resistance. That is the hallmark of early Alzheimer's. Right. I mean, these are the exact same things. 
you can show exactly the same things. And then over time, if you take the animals out to like 18 weeks, and you then you start seeing the amyloid plaques as well as tau protein in the brains of those mice. Wow. So that's pretty strong evidence. Okay. And and you so basically are inducing Alzheimer's right. in these laboratory. Right. They call rats. it an Alzheimer's model, but they it's yeah, exactly. Just fructose in the drinking. Just by giving fructose right. in the drinking water. Correct. Now, here's here's another bit of evidence. If if you take people with early Alzheimer's and, and they there was an autopsy study done in early Alzheimer's. Uh, they had like nine subjects and all nine had high, fructose levels in the brain fivefold higher than the controls mm. and the, you know, control autopsy brains. You know, there was five times more fructose and except one of the controls had high fructose, but when they went back and looked, they de decided they realized that that patient had early Alzheimer's too. Mm. So there is an association there. Okay. But here's one of the most interesting bits of data. Yeah. So uh, if you give fructose to a human, you, you, well, so let's go back. I, I want to talk about this foraging response again. Yes. So uh, when so, animals get fructose. So when animals get fructose, they start searching for food. Mm -hmm. And uh, foraging is a actual a behavioral response. It's, it's more than just looking for food. It involves a lot of things. First, you have to have exploratory behavior because you're going to go out into areas where you've never been. So you have to be a little exploratory. You, you can't deliberate on anything very long because you got to get in and get out. So you have to look around very quickly. You have to have good visual cues for food, you know, so that if you see that little piece of food up there, your eye catches it, you can see it, you know, that latch onto that chocolate cake, you know, that light up that part of the brain. You, you have to uh, have less self-control. If you have too much self-control, you're not going to go into an area that's dangerous, right? You don't. Sure. Uh, you have to be bold, impulsive. So th this is a behavioral set. In some respects, it's sort of um, like a hero, you know, the, the, the scout, the guy that's going to go out and try to, you know, get through the enemy lines. And, you know, I mean, it, there's some... Uh, aspects of it that are admirable. And uh, I think it is an admirable response. You, you, you know, you, you, you're willing to go out there and uh, try to try to find that food, but it's a, it's a real behavioral response. So it, uh, it turns out that to do that, you have to stimulate certain parts of the brain and you have to inhibit other areas of the brain. So the, a lot of the cerebral cortex is involved in self-control, especially the frontal cortex. So you would want to inhibit that if you're going to forage. The prefrontal cortex, yeah. which is our executive right. brain, we want to quiet that down. Yes, you want to reduce the activity there so that you have the self-control is not so strong. Right. Like, is this dangerous? Should I do this? Should yeah, I not? Exactly. We want to quiet yeah, that portion quiet of the brain down, down to get a little bit more into sort of like yeah. crazy hero mode, ready yeah, to yeah. risk take. Right. And you got to quiet the recent memory because you don't really want to remember how how dangerous it really is what you're about to do. Right. You don't want to remember that line you saw yesterday, you know, sure. you, you know, so you want to quiet that you want to stimulate, uh, you know, the visual cues, you know, so that you can see things, uh, real quickly. You want to, uh, reduce the, the activity to the areas that are involved in deliberation so that you, you know, you, 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 you want to stimulate locomotor activity. So there are some things you want to stimulate and some things you want to inhibit. Mm hmm so when you give fructose to a human intravenously or orally, you can do this thing called bold MRI and you can do these different things where you can look at changes in blood flow. You can look at that and guess what? If you give fructose, you activate the, these foraging responses. You inhibit the cortex, you inhibit blood flow to the uh, hippocampus, which is involved in recent memory. You stimulate the, you know, other areas, you, you know, like the visual cortex, the, the, for cues for food. And you can show that if you give glucose acutely and you just look in the first 15 minutes, remember it takes an hour for the glucose to start converting. So sure. if you look the first 15 minutes, you see the opposite effects of fructose. Fru glucose is not aiming to, to make you hungry. It's to satisfy you. So it's more of a, it's a different. 
So, uh, so it turns out that like uh, the foraging response requires activation of the anterior cingulate. It's a part of the brain and the occiput and, and, and the anterior cingulate is, has been uniquely known to be spared in Alzheimer's mm. as, and the, uh, you know, the visual cortex is generally spared. Whereas the, the, all the areas that fructose inhibits turn out to be the regions of the brain that are specifically, uh, you know, targeted by uh, in Alzheimer's, right. especially, you know, I mean, eventually Alzheimer's will affect all the brain, but you know, in the beginning, in especially. the beginning, you can really show this difference. And so when I, when I uh, presented I, that to Dale and to, uh, to David Perlmutter, you know, they go, you know, this is, this is pretty significant because it's not, not so many people have been able to explain why Alzheimer's affects one region and not another. Right. What's going on in the body that you also see this behavior, if you want to talk about it, yeah. in often elderly patients that have Alzheimer's. Yes, they start wandering. They start wandering. Yeah. Right? Anybody it, who has, my grandfather suffered from you know, yeah, dementia, they, Alzheimer's yeah. for years. They forget where they are. They start looking around. Yeah. They're looking. They sometimes end up, it can be very dangerous. Yes. Uh, my mom used to work at an elderly home for a period of time when we were younger. You know, they'd regularly have know, patients it's, it's go sh- outside, end up on the street. Yeah. You get Amber Alerts for elderly patients here in Los Angeles all the time who end up outside of their nursing home or sort of wandering out on their house. And it, in the same way, you're sort of connecting the dots that you can induce that in laboratory rats. Yep. If you feed them fructose, right. you can create this sort of wandering aspect. Yep. And it's partly maybe an evolutionary thing that we were designed. It was a survival mechanism. It was a survival mechanism. But this is kind of happening to Alzheimer's patients because probably a big part is their diet. Yeah. yeah. So, so yes. So to summarize how we think of this or the way I think of this, and I have to, again, thank David Perlmutter and Dale Bredesen and Maria Nagel. And, but what we think is going on or is that, um, you know, fructose developed as an evolutionary mechanism to help animals survive. Fructose is the nutrient that helps you store energy and it's there. It's meant to help you. You know, it was, it was meant to, to be a good thing when, when there's very little food coming, you want to eat fructose to store that fat. You want to uh, stimulate foraging so you can get the food so you can survive. It's all meant to be short term and to be beneficial. But what's happened is we develop tastes for foods that could make fructose, right? We develop sweet taste so we could pick out that food. We salt taste so that we could pick out the foods that, that tend to help put fat on us. And in a world of hunter gatherers, and uh, in a world where, where food wasn't so easily available, these were beneficial, you know? And if you, you, you know, and then, uh, you know, now that we have all this, high fructose corn syrup and sugary foods and processed foods injected with salt and sugar. And we have, uh, you know, and, and now that we can go to the grocery store whenever we want and we, we learn to crave sugar and we, and then we, uh, you know, we, we develop a craving and create, some people crave salty foods and, 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 and we're eating all these foods to stimulate this foraging and all this. And what's happening is, we're reducing the ATP, the energy in these cells, you know, in our brain and our muscle, and and it's leading to muscle wasting, sarcopenia. It's leading to, uh, you know, as we lose our energy in the brain, as the cells get less ATP, they can't function as well. And then what happens is they start dying, and they get inflamed, and they start creating these amyloid plaques. It's kind of a inflammation, inflammatory response to the low energy state. And so that's what's going on, I think. And and uh, and so the wonderful—it's not wonderful, but the wonderful aspect of of this is that if we actually understand what causes it, we can design and and try to figure out how to prevent it. And you know, already groups are—I mean, Dale Bredesen has been a leader at uh, you know developing healthy diets and approaches to to try to block Alzheimer's. Uh, and there are other groups as well that are doing keto diets and low carb diets as a mechanism to try to reduce, uh, you know, they, to improve the energy in the brain. 
And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of positive things coming. We've known that hunter gatherers like the Samani, uh, who live in Bolivia don't really get Alzheimer's and, and they're living in a very healthy environment. Uh, we know it's not natural fruits. So please, all of you, you know, it's, it's right. We're not trying to create yeah, fruit. Yeah. Fruit I phobia. want you to continue to eat fruits, but, um, but, but, you know, dense sugars, high glycemic carbs, we need to reduce those. We need to drink more water. Uh, we discovered uh, that you can, that when you drink water, you can block that enzyme that converts the glucose to fructose. You can actually inhibit that enzyme by, by staying well hydrated. And, and we could stop weight gain and so forth in, in animals on sugar by just drink, giving them water. And we did studies in people too. So drinking like eight, eight glasses of water a day, uh, eight, eight ounce glasses is very healthy. Drinking a glass of water before you eat your meal is very beneficial. I have some water right here. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. while you take a sip, you know, just to connect all these dots together, Yeah. here you are understanding that your work in the space of obesity and what was driving things like hypertension and you found this pathway and, and how uric acid was a precursor to it. But what drives up uric acid that led you to a few things, but in particular fructose. Right. And that led to also the conversation around mitochondria and what's damaging right. our ability to produce energy and right. what's causing more insulin resistance in the body. So we have fructose, which is a poison <laughs> for that. Well, some of the same things that induce obesity inside of the body that yeah. you were able to induce obesity in sort of laboratory rats, you know now that, well, that can almost induce Alzheimer's, not right. almost, it does induce right. al Alzheimer's, yeah, as you call it, Alzheimer's mod model right. in rats. And so now the connection and where you're calling it a theory is that this explains why something like Alzheimer's happens to certain parts of the brain, but maybe not other parts of the brain right. and how fructose could be a big driver yeah. of this connection. So in theory, the explosion of our modern industrialized diet that we've had over the last, yeah. what, since 1930s, yeah. around there, 40s, 50s, somewhere around there. And the increase every year of fructose, highly processed calorie, also highly processed salts right. inside of the diet, not, you know, sea salt and stuff that we add to our food, a little bit of broccoli, you know, grilling something or stir frying. We're talking about highly concentrated forms of salt in the food that's yeah. added in the factory before we even get it that these couple things, and I have a question about saturated fat because you talked about that last yeah, time. Yeah. We'll get to that in a second. That these things could be a reason why we see an explosion of Alzheimer's rates right. that are out there today. Yeah, I think that's right. So yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's a hypothesis. So, But you're showing but your homework. It, but the evidence is very strong, I think. And, um, and, and, and it continues to get stronger as the more we study it and you know, recently I was, uh, you know, uh, after we published this paper, we've been approached by several groups that are studying uh, Alzheimer's and, and there's a relationship between fructose and ApoE4, the, the, uh, the gene that's associated with uh, higher risk. With higher risk. And there's, um, there's data that it, with aging that some of these changes that we're predicting actually are being found by others now. And um, so I, I think that there's this story is going to continue to develop, and I do believe that we can, that it, that we'll be able to to intervene. Uh, and, you know, maybe one day we'll also be able to provide drugs that can block fructose metabolism in the brain. Sure. And uh, and that you know we know that when drugs can be combined with lifestyle factors. Yes. Because as you mentioned with Alzheimer's, one of the big challenges is even the drugs can that can remove some amyloid plaque, they haven't necessarily uh, gotten to this place where right. we're saying, take this drug to lower the risk right. of Alzheimer's. Uh, and then there's the whole conversation of side effects. That are yeah. there. And yeah. then there's the whole other conversation about how expensive uh, expensive are these drugs. Yeah. There was the big one that was in the news. Uh, what was the name of the Alzheimer's drug that they were theorizing that a lot of insurance companies said, we're not going to out of it. Lecanemab or aducanemab. Adjuvan, is that the name of it? Aducanemab. Yes, yes. And they were thinking that, you know, a lot of insurance insurance yeah. said, we, we, we're we not going to cover the cost of this. It's going to bankrupt yeah. us, right? So there's a whole layer. Yeah, well, hopefully, you know, if, if someone develops an inhibitor for fructose right. metabolism, hopefully they'll realize that it's better not to charge a lot 
because you can help a lot more people. Totally, totally. And so uh, you, you don't have to be an economist to realize that if you you know you could help a lot a lot of different diseases. You you not only would do a lot of great benefit, but you'll you'll still make money even if you sell for a penny. A, right, a pill. totally. <laughs> and, and in the meantime, again, you know, there's tons of life saving drugs that are out there. You know, different family members right. of mine are probably on some drug yeah. or another. Right. And in the meantime, there are things that we can do. Right. We can start today. That's right. I think diet is and exercise are two things that are really, really key. So, um, and, and before we go into diet, actually, let's talk about exercise because we I haven't really it. talked about I love it exercise. Yeah. enough. And the thing about exercise, in particular strength training, we've done a lot yeah. of episodes on this recently. The bigger your muscles get, the better you are at utilize, utilizing free-floating glucose that's inside of the body. Absolutely. So the lean body mass, if you can increase the muscle mass, that definitely will help in dramatic ways in terms of metabolism, how much you can eat, the, the ability to store energy or, or to use energy. So that, yeah, it, there's even, you know, so one of the problems is that if you lose muscle mass, um, it it doesn't take that much food to, 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 uh, supply all the energy needs and so you, you end up a lot of people with very low muscle mass will tend to gain weight or go into a positive energy balance even with a small amount of of you know with relatively small amount of food yeah and we've had experts on this podcast like dr donald layman and his research in pro yeah. protein and mus muscle synthesis yeah and we've had dr gabrielle lyon who's come on this yeah. podcast and some scary statistics yeah, right yeah. after the age of 40 I turned 40 last year, and this was a big wake-up call for me. After the age of 40, every decade, you lose on average for people who are not strain training right. and not eating adequate amounts of protein, you know, and finding out however you want to find your protein, depending on your dietary preferences, you're losing the, the stats that they were sharing with me, 8% of your muscle mass every decade. And, and, you know, we, we have a paper that's in press and where, which uh, we can show that, you know, when animals develop kidney disease or metabolic syndrome, they start to lose muscle mass. And that low energy, that low ATP is actually occurring in the muscle as well as in the liver and all these different places. So the eight, when the energy levels drop, uh, the ability for the cells to to function well goes way down and you start actually losing muscle mass in part. So it's not just you're losing muscle mass because you're not exercising uh, for strength. It's, uh, it's that when the energy levels start to fall inside the cell, you start losing the muscle, period. And if we, you know, genetically manipulate the animals so that they maintain the so that they don't get that ATP depletion, you know, so if we block parts of that pathway, we can maintain muscle mass even in an animal with kidney failure. So even if somebody's strength training, for example, if they might be eating a higher diet in fructose, it could be tougher for them to maintain that muscle mass Absolutely. that's there. That's exactly right. Because of the damage that's being done to the mitochondria. Right. right. So there's two, the way to view muscle is there's two factors. One is what's driving the loss of the muscle, sarcopenia is actually an inflammatory condition. Uh, and there's a loss, it's centered around a low ATP level. So when you exercise, you're, you're doing everything you can to help maintain muscle mass, and that's good. And if you exercise in certain ways, uh, you can actually stimulate mitochondrial repair and, and what we call biosynthesis. By, so you can actually stimulate mitochondrial, uh, the mitochondria to to increase the in number, biogenesis. And exercise is fantastic for that, especially endurance exercise like zone two. That's really good for that. So strengthening is great to help with the muscle, but also you want to do uh, zone two exercise to increase the mitochondria uh, to, to generate. It stimulates mitochondrial recovery. Um, and just, just to clarify for people, you know, zone two is typically people would say it's the type of workout. Like, let's say if you're walking a little bit uphill or something, it's strenuous enough where you can still, it's, it, you can still talk, right? But it's, it's not too strenuous that you can still talk, but it's strenuous enough that it's a little bit difficult to talk while you're doing it. That is exact. Yeah. And it goes, I'm stealing that from Peter Atia. You've been yeah, on his podcast yeah. before, which is how I first heard about your work was his, yeah, uh, it was, it's actually, uh, that, 
came from Inigo San Milan originally, who uh, is a, a exercise physiologist. He's coached for the Tour de France and everything. And he has found that this is this type of exercise. And this is exactly how he describes it, how you did, that that is the one of the best ways to stimulate the mitochondria to grow. But you also want to do strengthening. You want to do, uh, you know, some training. Yeah, you definitely want to do both. But um, they both do different things. But the uh, stimulating the mitochondria to grow is really key to helping recover your mitochondria if you've damaged them. Mm. So, so that's a big takeaway here today is that it's an, it's another reason why probably our ancestors that might be having more fructose in their diet and the top sources obviously were not high fructose corn syrup, sugar sweetened drinks, but they would have eaten a lot of fruit, which again, we've talked about is not as bad of an issue. You know, it's not an issue. Uh, honey also has a little bit of fructose inside of it. Is that right? Yes. So, yeah. so uh, in the past, the main sources of fructose, you know, before sugar was discovered was honey and fruit. And, uh, and again, I'm going to say that small amounts of that probably are totally fine to, to really get into trouble. You have to eat large, large amounts quantities. of fruits or like fruit juices or dried fruit, right. large amounts yeah, of dried, dried fruit. fruit. That's right. Right. That's so. And, our, our, and honey is, is, uh, you know, no one's really done a lot of studies with honey, but I am concerned, you know, that honey is a problem, you know, um, like if you go to Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, there's a lot of desserts pastries that are made with honey uh, and honey is often used as a, is 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 almost like used like sugar over there right uh, but on the flip a, side i mean if you really look at their total calories etc yeah, they're exactly. probably having all the salt yeah they're yes, having all the yes. saturated and they're getting the carbs they're getting the, the carbs with pastry it. i feel you know david perlmutter has written an article about honey uh when he was writing his last book which was inspired by your work right he yeah. basically dedicated it to you yes right? and, drop acid that's yeah, a great drop book acid, on uric all about acid. uric acid and he wrote a little love letter to honey right talking about the other beneficial reasons we know that you know honey was sought after by our hunter gatherer ancestors and there seems to be different reasons yeah. that honey could have been a major part of our diet that's there but again how I, no I, I mean i agree with you uh, that we don't know, and you know, honey has a lot of ingredients besides sugar. Sure, and it, it, you, you know, in some respects, it might be like natural fruit, where it has a lot of really good things in it that outweigh the, the that negative outweigh things. the negative. And, and, and I believe that that's why I say, you know, if you want to eat a little honey, for sure, I I would not say no. But if you eat a ton of honey, it's going to be like eating a ton of fruit. You know, you know. Which, which also was very hard to do in the past, yes, right? If right. you if you look at like the Hadza who regularly yeah. have honey, you see these videos. First of all, it's not always available. Right. Then when you go find a beehive, you have to basically get stung, <laughs> yeah. right? There's usually one or two warriors who are like going to go up first, going to grab it, knock it off. Yeah. They're going to get stung. It's like, it's an effort. You're not yeah. just going down to the local right. grocery store no. and getting as much honey as you want. <laughs> right, exactly. Right? So, and it's also, it's, 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 hard to kind of gorge on honey. You don't see a lot of people gorging on honey right. because of the other concentrated calories that are out there, right? Uh, but anyways, we got onto this topic because we were saying that on the topic of strength training, the connection that I was making is that even if our hunter-gatherer ancestors, wherever we ended up originating from, they had so much movement in their life just out of survival, trying to survive, trying to forage for food, trying to hunt animals and do all the things that they were doing, right? right? That that strength training, that zone two activity that they were doing, not because it was cool to go to the gym, but right. because it was required for survival. So even if they did have more fructose, you know, during the winter months, or if they did have a lot of honey during certain periods, they're working out so much that it's not an issue for them, right? right? And here we are, we have the worst of both worlds. We're not working out. We're way sedentary. The vast majority of people are not doing any kind of strength training and they're definitely not doing any kind of zone two activity that's yeah. there. So just incorporating more activity could be one way of addressing yes. and getting to the root of this. Yeah, so the, the exercise is you know, probably one of the very best things what we can do to stay healthy as you, and it's not just because we wanna look better, it's because exercise improves our mitochondria. And, um, and if you can improve the mitochondria and re help repair the mitochondria, you can repair the damage that occurs from eating a lot of sugar and so forth.
Totally. So, so it's really important. It's probably the most important. The other one things that can help, there's actually one uh, that I haven't talked that much about, but um, vitamin C is also a, a very, very good compound. It's an antioxidant that actually blocks the oxidative stress in the mitochondria that's induced by uric acid. So it actually is sort of a, a counters some of the mechanisms by which fructose causes obesity. Mm. And uh, we, we did a, you know, so humans don't make vitamin C. You know, right. that's why it's a vitamin for us. We have to get vitamin C. And, you know, it was a mystery why humans don't make vitamin C. And um, uh, it turns out that all primates except lemurs um, have a pro uh, don't make vitamin C. And so the question is, why was that? And it turned out that there was a mutation in vitamin C that occurred in our past uh, around the time of the dinosaur extinction. Mm. And um, during that time, there was- You're talking about mammals specifically. Yeah, well, so the, yeah, you know, the, at the end of the Cretaceous, um, you know, the, the KT transition, I guess it's the Triassic, but it, you know, uh, 66 million years ago, there was a, a terrible like, asteroid impact that led to the, extinction of many, many species, including the dinosaurs. And um, the, there were primates that were alive at that time. There were primates that were early, some of the earliest primates were, were there. And we think that the mutation occurred at that time and might have provided a survival advantage because if you didn't make vitamin C, you would get more oxidative stress from from fructose and so it would be a, a survival mechanism mm. so we actually uh did a study where we uh we we knocked out vitamin c in a mouse so that the mouse couldn't make vitamin c so you had to give the mouse a little bit of vitamin c or it would become it would develop scurvy you know right. of, and then what we did is we we gave them either a low dose of vitamin c or a high dose of vitamin c and so uh the animals on the high, and then we offered them high fructose corn syrup. And both groups drank the same amount of high fructose corn syrup, but the high vitamin C group um, reduced the the amount of, th their hunger probably reduced the leptin resistance, although I, I don't think we measured that. But, um, but the animals on the high doses of vi vitamin C gained, became less fat. They were, we could significantly block obesity. And we it was, and so I think what happened is the vitamin C mutation was also a survival mutation to help us survive a period of time when there wasn't food very, very much available because of this big extinction, and there was there wasn't a lot of plants around. Uh, the, you know, the whole world got dark for like several hundred years, and um, and so. Uh, my my belief is that that mutation was a survival mutation. So another reminder that you know from citrus foods, things like that, whole foods, not orange yeah. juice. If we can get vitamin C right. or potentially a high quality yeah. supplement, yeah, that that could be one of the things that could protect us from the damage. Yeah, there's so there's some actually pretty good data that vitamin C can reduce some of the features of metabolic syndrome, like uh, like blood pressure, triglycerides. Um, Any suggestions on you know dosages? Yeah, or anything I would like that? recommend 500, 500 milligrams twice a day. Five hundred milligrams twice a day, so a yeah. thousand milligrams a right. day. Right, yeah. and there is you know because it blocks the mitochondria uh, oxidative stress, it's going to be a a very helpful thing. Um, but there is some data like if you're a super athlete, if you take vitamin, you know, so to stimulate mitochondrial growth. Um, like in a in a really healthy person, you want you want to induce a little bit of oxidative stress to the mitochondria, just a little bit, because if you do, it stimulates, the, it gets them going, and then they they make more mitochondria. So it's sort of this ironic thing where if you have a lot of oxidative stress, you you kill the mitochondria it's too much, and if you have just a tiny bit, it helps the mitochondria get strong. Proliferate. That's the idea of uh, 
hormetic hormesis, right? Like yeah. the hormetic effect, of like Goldilocks yeah. approach. So, so like if you have metabolic syndrome and you have high oxidative stress going on in your mitochondria, vitamin C is going to be fantastic for you. But let's say you're a super athlete and you're doing the Tour de France. You may not want to be taking vitamin C to quelch if you have just a little bit of oxidative stress going on in those mitochondria because you know, then it may prevent the mitochondria from get, from growing. Right, which is not going to be most people that are listening right. to this podcast are not going to be that super happy. <laughs> that's right. So for generally most people, yeah. 500 to 1,000 milligrams yeah, that's of vitamin perfect. C that's a, a day. That's perfect. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. I, I strongly recommend that. Um, but like if you are a super athlete, I probably would not. Right. You're adding in the caveat. Right. Yes. So now we're going to get into diet, right? Yeah. Okay. We've talked a little bit about it first. You know, salt we've chatted a bunch about. Just by not consuming highly processed, you know, rolls, breads, things that you pick up from the grocery store. And you can look on the back and you can see the sodium content. That's the vast majority of sodium that we're seeing, especially in the industrialized world, which right. is now not just America and Europe, but it's being exported around the world to places like yeah. India, yeah. Saudi Arabia, you mentioned, et cetera, et cetera. So that's going to be the best approach for tackling salt. How do you feel within the caveat of is there a threshold or a dosage of, of sodium that you feel induces this? Because what's common these days, or, you know, I'm asking myself, is that people who are quite active, you know, I do strength training, you know, yeah. three to four days yeah. a week. I do a lot of uh, sports and activities. Yeah. And so I'll have electrolytes that have some salt with them. And I put a little bit of sea salt on my food yeah. when I'm making it at night. I'm not really worried about that. But uh, yeah, is there some level of sodium that I should be, you know, wary of? based on what you've come across. So uh, salt and water kind of- Neutralize be, each other. You, you neutralize each other and should be thought of together. Right. Okay. So uh, we actually did a study where we gave uh, salty soup to people and you can really mask the amount of salt in soup. So we gave a, a pretty good dose that could increase the salt concentration in their blood just by two points. So normal serum sodium is like 135 to 140, 135 to 145. Um, and uh, we, we gave enough s soup with s enough salt in the soup to raise the sodium in the blood by just two points. So and they, how many uh, grams or milligrams was this? Do you know? In I was like two to three grams. Okay, so that's quite a bit. Yeah, it was a lot. And what happened is uh, we, we then gave the soup with or without water. So they got they either had to drink a, a fair amount of water or actually a large amount of water. And if and what we did is when when they, we just gave the salty soup, the salt concentration went up in the blood. That's what triggers this switch to make fructose. And we could show evidence of that switch in the blood. And we knew that they and their blood pressure went way up, you know, also a sign. And then at the same time, we the people who ate the exact same amount of salt but drank water with it, their salt concentration didn't go up. Their blood pressure didn't go up. They didn't trigger the switch. Right. So it's all about the mixture. So for example, I, like if you drink a glass of water before a meal and there's a little bit of salt in it, you're probably going to neutralize the effects of the salt. And, and as soon as you get thirsty, if you eat some salty food and you get thirsty, you've already activated the switch you've activated this fructose pathway. As soon as you think you're, as soon as you feel thirsty, it's being activated. So in a way you're saying, if you know you're gonna be having more salt in your diet. Just drink more water. Just drink more water. That's one way. It's yeah. a process yeah. of dilution. Yeah. You're yeah. diluting the amount of salt. I mean, if you are salt. out working and working out and you're sweating, you need salt, right? Of course, you're, it's an important reason it's why important. a lot of people recommend electrolytes like myself. Yes, I do too. But but the, the deal is you wanna drink water with it if you're starting to get thirsty, it's you're you you know you're you're getting behind. Right now, now there is this thing where people who are running marathons, I, I you only want to drink if you are thirsty to quench that thirst because people who drink uh, who run marathons sometimes can get water intoxicated if they're drinking a lot of water. Right. So um, and so I would not uh you know. I would be careful about drinking a lot of water if you're like doing marathons. Got it. But but in general, for most people, for the vast majority of us, we should be drinking more water than we are. 
we're, the, the data shows that we're, we're not drinking enough. People who are overweight and obese are almost always mild, mildly dehydrated. You can show it by measuring numbers in their urine and, uh, you know, and so forth. You can show that they're slightly dehydrated. Um, there's a recent study from the National Institute of Health that just got published that shows that if you look at the serum sodium, your, your salt concentration in the blood, if it's on the upper end, but still, quote, within the normal range, it increases your risk for dementia, obesity, diabetes, all those things, Wow, which goes along with our idea that a high salt concentration stimulates fructose. Definitely. Yeah. So, uh, and if anybody is just looking for, you know, a, a free resource on this, we wrote a newsletter that's a hydration challenge. Yeah. I've just over the years tried to get more of my friends, you know, interested in drinking more water. Yeah. And I realized that, especially in the morning, when you first wake up and your body's already dehydrated, right? People typically will have a little bit of water and then they'll go immediately to coffee. Something right. that's already going to dehydrate them further, right? Right, and I love coffee, just like yeah. the next person. Yeah, I have coffee too. <laughs> yeah, so coffee's great, but they're already starting off their day dehydrated, and we already know from a lot of different studies, including the one you just mentioned, a, even a one percent drop in in sort of hydration can have major impacts on focus yeah. and a whole bunch of things. Absolutely. So, so we have a whole little protocol of you know electrolytes, or if you don't want to use electrolytes, just even yeah. a little bit of salt at home that you can use with that's lemon fine. water. And put into a big, you know, the, my goal is to get people to drink first uh, 12 to 16 ounces of water. Perfect. Right? And then before they jump right away into their first cup of coffee, nurse another 12 or 16 ounces yes. of water that you can have along with your coffee yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's wonderful. I mean, uh, the what I, my rule was to always drink a glass of water before each meal. Yes. Uh, and to do, do it before the meal. Because that, right. if anything, you drop the serum salt concentration a little bit, and then if it's a little bit low and you bring it up to normal, so what? It's not going to trigger anything. I forgot to mention the other big source of salt in people's diets after bread rolls, it's potato chips. Yes, potato, potato chips, chips are, are very addictive very, because it's that salt, that fat, that carbs oh, all together, and you'll get a ton of sodium from yeah, that. They, yeah, this the vin salt and vinegar. Oh my gosh, you know, yeah. the, those chips taste very good. They're addictive. And, um, I can't even start, I, which is why yeah, I don't no, eat potato I, me chips. too. Yeah, but yeah, uh, but you're exactly right. So, like, if you go to a bar and you're going to eat those pretzels, drink a glass of water first. Right. Drink water. Dilute the salt that's and, there. And so, I'm not anti-salt. Right. I'm uh, anti-high salt concentrations in the blood. So the trick is to to do the balance of salt and water so that you, you don't want to be thirsty. Yeah, definitely. Great. Let's go to the next category that's there. And just as a little bit of a recap, which is yeah. the big sources of fructose, because this has been a whole conversation around fructose. Right. So dietary fructose from everything that I've gathered, and we chatted a little bit last time, soft drinks number are, one. are number one. Right? They're, they're the worst. Next one would be fruit juice would be right up there for Correct. people who have that. Right. Absolutely. So fruit juice is a concentrated form of fruit. You're going to get a lot more fruit than you typically could eat in one sitting by yourself. And again, fruit is great, but it comes with the fiber and it comes with the phytonutrients and all these other things that are there. Vitamin C, as you've mentioned. And so let's eat whole fruit. Let's stay away from fruit juice. Yes. And I do recommend fruit, especially, you know, there are differences in the types of fruits. So some fruits are healthier than others. Like kiwi is relatively low in fructose, very high in vitamin C. It's a wonderful fruit. The berries, like strawberries, blueberries, they contain a lot of flavanols that counter the effects of fructose. We actually did studies where we gave epicatechin to people, you know, with a, after giving them a soft drink. And, you know, you can block some of the effects of fructose with flavanols that are present in berries, you know? Yeah. So like blueberries, they're very healthy, strawberries. Um, another, you know, uh, other fruits that I, I like, um, I mean, oranges actually are very high in vitamin C. I like them. It, they, they do contain some sugar, obviously, if you I don't recommend orange juice, but I do, I, I do like oranges and, um, and some fruit, like uh, plums and figs. Figs are probably the worst. And I know you probably love figs. Well, I want to contextualize when you're saying the worst, right? Because we probably are not having an epidemic of people eating a ton of 
you know, fructose figs. because they're overeating on figs. Right. Right. But but I will tell you, uh, figs are, are, are have the highest amount of concentrated fructose of any fruit. Yeah. And it's the one that the like the chimpanzees and the orangutans. I mean, there a lot of primates love them because they they use them to store fat. They use sure. them. Figs so, are a precursor to your body ready to store fat. Yes. And in fact, you think that a big, you know, I think you teamed up with, was it National Geographic or who was it that yeah. you guys worked with? And you were theorizing that when we got this adaptation for uric acid, that figs was one of the main that was fruit the, sources. Uh, what was the paper that you guys? It's Scientific America. Scientific America. My apologies. My apologies. Um uh, what was the title of that? That's an interesting thing that we should link to if we could pull that out. Yeah, um, the fat gene, I think it the was. The fat called. gene, Scientific America. But you, they were theorizing, and you guys were theorizing that in this period of time when we were coming out of uh, an ice age, that figs and our migration of human beings and the development of sort of our uric acid pathway all kind of coincided together. Is that accurate? And that, That's it. And that was part of the way that we were able to survive the winters is we would gorge ourselves on figs, store up a bunch of fat, and do all the things that you were talking about at the beginning of the podcast. Yes. Yeah. So, so this, again, this was a story where I, I uh, joined up with an arche uh, a paleontologist who's a world expert on, you know, the history, you know, the evolution of apes. So I ended up working with P Peter Andrews, who's a world-class uh, anthropologist who studied the this uh, period of time in history it was in the mid miocene and and it was a time when the uh, our ancestors were actually apes at that right. point they were ancestral apes and they were the you know the predecessors for not just humans but also for the great apes and so forth right and um there was a period of time there with where they were going there was a global cooling and the apes started to starve and you could show that they were starving during the cooler seasons so this was the big insight from from peter andrews he said you know that you know when global cooling was occurring it would the areas in africa were still warm so the apes that were living in africa uh didn't have to change their diet there was still fruit all year round but there were apes living in europe at the time and in europe the it was cooler than the cooler seasons. The the, the fruit trees started to uh, th there was a loss of fruit trees, a loss of fruiting during the during the fall, and the primates started to have trouble surviving over the, the there winter. There wasn't enough food. There wasn't enough food. But then, fig and the key was the was the loss of the fig because the fig is the one fruit that tends to fruit uh, fruit all year round ah. because of the way it, it's germinated by a wasp and. And so uh, it was the loss of the fig that led to, you know, the seasonal period where the, the cooler, the winter season, there wasn't enough food around. And so the apes started to starve. That was when this mutation occurred in uric acid and that uh, increased our uric acid levels. And we were we able, we even resurrected the gene and did all kinds of studies. But in essence, that we, we found strong evidence that that mutation led to a rise in uric acid and in, increased the ability of us to make fat from even small amounts of, uh, smaller amounts of fruit. Right. It's fascinating. It's a great read. I think it's available online that we can link to in the show notes. Yeah. But just to come back to figs, you know, I think, you know, again, people are not eating probably a, a ton of figs right. out there. Thank there are a lot of dried figs and dried fruit. And there is a little bit of a, you know, public service announcement that you want to make is that even if people think that they're eating really healthy, you see often that people, if they're not eating a lot of processed foods, they still may be drinking a lot of processed juice, right? Yeah, or just fruit right. juice or yeah. even juicing at home. And they tend to kind of the older hippie granola movement that was there. There's a lot of trail mix and yeah. that tends to have a lot of dried fruit. And if you are eating a significant amount of dried fruit, that can also be a concentrated source of fructose inside yes. the diet. The vast majority of people, it's not going to be but there are some people right. that you pay attention I agree, to that. I agree with you on that. Yeah. So, okay. So don't eat fig newtons every night. Fig newtons every night. Cause then you got the carbs, <laughs> you got this, you got that. I loved them when I was a kid though. Now, anything else that we should pay attention to before I j jump into the topic of saturated fat, because we talked about it last time. Okay. Anything else on 
the fructose uric acid pathway that are the do's and the don'ts that you want to talk about. For our community here that's looking to have the takeaways, there may be a blockbuster yeah, so, Alzheimer's drug that comes out right. that addresses fructose. But in the meantime, if we're trying to limit it in our diet, what else should we, okay, we be paying well, attention so, to? So foods that contain sugar and high fructose corn syrup. So reading the labels, processed foods are your main source. Um, you know, you want to reduce sugar intake. You want to reduce high fructose corn syrup intake. Obviously, you know, eat fewer desserts or try to eat sugar-free desserts or, or natural fruit is a good choice. But, but try not to, uh, to eat a lot of sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And the main problems are power drinks and soft drinks, um, energy drinks that have a lot of sugar. And do you have a feeling about diet soda? Often people, when they're looking to lose weight, they'll switch from traditional soda to diet soda. Yeah. So our group has studied diet drinks in our models and, and the diet drinks tend not to, they do not cause obesity by themselves, okay? Um, they don't activate the switch. They don't generate fructose. The one exception is sorbitol. That's a artificial sugar that's used like in uh, uh, chocolate syrups and hmm. ma maple syrup. I mean, uh, sh syrups like for- It's for, a sugar alcohol because it's a tall yeah, yeah. sorbitol? Yeah, so it's often used in like, uh, you know, uh, like uh, syrups for pancakes and stuff like that. That sorbitol gets converted to fructose, so be very careful about that one. Got it. But in general, but in general, they they don't. Right. They don't. But they do keep you uh, addicted to sweets. Right. So it's and that and, could cause a uh, excess eating. Right. It could drive you to have it, and yeah. seek out more it's calories. It's going to It's going to keep teasing you because you're going to continue to want sweet foods. Yeah. Diet, diet soda got a, a really bad rap in the health community. And obviously, it's, there's no, there's nothing that's ideal about right. diet soda, but there's been a lot of really great people, like you know, that have talked about that for some individuals who drink, you know, two to three sodas a day, and in in Mexico in particular, there's which has the highest consumption of soda around the world. You have the, you know, you, you have people that are drinking sometimes up to like a liter a day. Yeah. Right. It, oh, it's it's, it's pretty pervasive in Mexico, and there's a big problem with diabetes down oh, there. Oh yeah. So for those individuals and for a lot of our audience that might be watching this that's just getting started, you know, diet soda can be a stepping stone in the right direction. Absolutely. The health community was worried about it because of changes in the gut microbiome, but that still seems to be a little bit inconclusive. Yeah. We've seen a little bit of that with saccharin, but that's the only one that we've seen it with. And that's the only one that's really been published. When we looked at other artificial sugars, we don't see an induction of insulin resistance. Right. And so again, it's a stepping stone, right. but if you're not eating, having diet soda, we're right. not telling you to start with diet soda. Right. You know, there's plenty of other things that you can be choosing. Like we have tea or you have coffee yeah. or have X, you know, all sorts of different options that are out there. And I have no affiliation with this company, but there's a company called Olipop. That's like a natural soda alternative. Yeah. And there's one sweetened with Zevia, like, uh, uh, yeah. with stevia, like called Zevia. Yeah. So there's a lot of options that are yeah. out there. Yeah, exactly. So it's definitely better than drinking a real soft drink with high fructose corn syrup. Right. Because that will will activate this switch for sure. Okay, great. So so anyway, so and then you want to watch out for the high glycemic carbs. And there's really four major groups, right? Bread. Yeah. I love bread, but bread isn't good for us. You know, if you eat a lot of bread, that blood glucose goes up and then it's stimulating insulin, which isn't good, but it's also stimulating the production of fructose. And that's not good. Right. And and, and rice, especially white rice, potatoes, uh, cereal, you know, chips, uh, you know, I, they're usually potatoes, but but basically potatoes, rice, cereal, and and bread are the the four major types of food that are high in starch that will raise, that will be used, you, that you will can make fructose from. So. Right. And, and would you say, for example, if somebody is strength training and getting a lot more exercise, then generally they can have a little bit more freedom inside of their oh, diet. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Like I right now have rice probably like three times a week yeah, since perfect. I started my training program last right. August. And 
I feel great and actually helps me improve because I'm not eating a lot of other concentrated right. sources of carbs besides vegetables. Right. I've seen improvements in the gym as well by yeah. having a little bit more rice inside of and having some more carbohydrates, but I'm also quite active as well. Yeah. So, so glucose is a great fuel, right? A lot of, I mean, you, when you're exercising, you need to have s- some glucose around for sure. And, you know, uh, Inigo Samalan, you know, argues that, you know, hydration drinks should include some glucose, but, you know, you don't want to give so much that you're producing fructose. Right. And that's the problem with most people. They just have so high levels of carbohydrates in general right. that, in their diet right. that that's when they, you know, yeah. and, and a good good sign of that is that their fasting insulin is high, usually right. above 10. Right. Right. My fasting insulin is three. I get it measured every month. Month. And I was worried when I started to eat rice, I was like, oh my gosh, is, you know, cause I was at two previously 2.5 and I was like, oh man, I'm going to start, you know, cause there, sometimes there can be a little bit of fear in the wellness world yeah, around course. stuff. There could be fruit phobia, there could be carbohydrate phobia. Right. But again, if you're active, if you're, if you're yeah. generally staying away from processed foods, if you're not drinking Coca-Colas and sodas and other things like that, and you're mostly eating whole foods, yeah. you can get away with eating some of these Absolutely. foods and they can be part of a healthy diet. We shouldn't have phobia around them. Exactly. And, and even mean, with bread, sorry to interrupt you one yeah. more time, is that things like sourdough can be a part oh, of yeah. a healthy diet. Yeah. You know, I, I do these tricks. Uh, like, for example, uh, you know, I have a glucose monitor because I'm very curious which foods make my glucose go up. Right. And, uh, you know, everybody has are maybe slightly different in their sensitivity to certain foods. Sure. Um, and, and I found that uh, sourdough bread and rye bread don't raise my glucose very much. Totally. They have more and, fiber and, inside and, of them. And, they're, and they taste just as good yeah. to me. That's great. Uh, That's an easy And app. another one is, uh, you know, like uh, if you put like avocado spread over a piece of bread, uh, what it does is it slows the absorption so the glucose doesn't go up as much. Right. And that's the whole idea of these different hacks. Right. And if you translate that, you know, people are going and eating at a restaurant, they serve the bread. Don't skip the bread, but keep it till the end of the meal. Absolutely. Right. That will work. That, that will, will work. work. And then eat your fat, fiber, yeah. protein. Right. And then enjoy the bread at the end yeah. where it's not going to spike your glucose as much. It, exactly. And there's people like, you know, the glucose goddess, Jesse uh, in Chapsby, who's been on this podcast before, who has a bunch of these hacks, you know, that people can follow. Yeah, on. yeah. No, these so are good tricks. It's white rice, potato, you know, wh- wh- you said white rice, bread. What else was it? Uh, white rice, bread, potatoes, cereals. Right. And we're wanting to minimize them. If you are basing your entire diet around all of those, which a lot of people are, they have cereal in the morning, they have French fries (laughs) from McDonald's or somewhere else. (laughs) Right. Right. That's why potatoes are one of the most consumed vegetables. It's not because people are eating a bunch of potatoes, they're eating French fries. Right. And then they have bread that's there. Then they have, you know, these soft drinks that are there. And then often they might have, you know, rice and right. and some meat in the evening. So they're getting all of them and their diet is based around that. That's when you have major problems right. when your diet is based around yeah. these things. And then, you know, we haven't talked about it, but there's some foods that we call umami foods, which, right. and, and some of them will raise uric acid more than others. And if you raise uric acid by umami, you can also activate this pathway. Yes. Uh, and we published it. Um, so the, the the classic are are things like rich shellfish, like uh, or like shrimp, lobster, crab. If you eat a lot of that, you can raise your uric acid and fairly what is easily. A lot? Because there's people here that are you know. Because you also mentioned like shrimp, right? Shrimp. If you eat shrimp every day, even though uh, you you're not eating a lot of other foods, you can get fat from it. Just because, because it's going to make you crave and seek out more calories. Well, what it does, it will raise your uric acid, which will, yeah, exactly. But the uric acid then, so it's a little bit complicated, but you know, fructose generates uric acid. Uric acid can cause this oxidative stress and lower the ATP in the cell. If you eat a lot of foods that raise uric acid that are not sugar, you can still suppress uh, the uh, mitochondria, but the biggest way that uric acid works, interestingly, is it amplifies and stimulates more production of fructose from glucose. So it sort of acts like salt. Um, and we, it turns out that if you're not eating a lot of carbs, the umami is much less dangerous because 
you got in order to make fructose, you have to have some carbs on right. board. So like if you're on a low carb diet and you're eating a lot of red meat, you're not going to have any problem. Your uric acid may go up, but you're not going to um, probably get any major problems, as much problems from it as as if you had carbs on board. Right. So it's so the, the through line really here is is these umami foods in the context of a high carbohydrate yes, diet. Yes, that's right. So in the South, especially, you know, Louisiana, I don't know if barbecue. it's a stereotype, barbecue, shrimp, other stuff. I mean, for most of them, I would say there's probably, if we did a global study or survey of the top consuming, because because you had mackerel on there as well, right. right? If you look at these seafoods that are there in the countries that probably have the highest concentration of consumption of them, not concentration, consumption, there's probably an inverse relationship with the obesity. Right. Because those communities are also not as pervasive on soft drinks yeah, it's and, and carbohydrates. Salt and sugar and... Right. processed foods like the amount of seafood that's being consumed in japan or china right. or other right. stuff you know their obesity rates are like you know three percent right compared to like the 50 percent that we're 60 percent that we're dealing with absolutely here. absolutely right so it seems like maybe the more the through line is the carbohydrates the salts inside of the diet and just the excess calories right. that people are seeking out because they're having too much fructose yeah it it seems like uh a high uric acid becomes really a bigger problem when you're when you're on a lot of carbs. When you're on a lot of carbs, great. Yeah. Okay. And if you're if you are on a low carb diet, interestingly, your uric acid levels may go up, uh, just from being on a low carb diet because you're eating now you're eating a high protein, so you you can bring your uric acid up, um, but usually it's not a problem. Right. And this is important for people to know because it's so crazy when people get diagnosed with gout. Yeah. And my dad was diagnosed many years ago before we kind of were in this whole world and everything. Yeah. And the doctor's telling them, okay, you know, some standard stuff that's is true, right? Like avoid, you know, uh, purine type foods, high concentration of yeast. They would yeah. say beer, which yeah. is true. And you found that yeah. through your work, right? That's, you that's don't want right. to be having a lot of beer that's right. because there's higher purines, uh, purine content inside of there because of the yeast, and that's going to drive uric yeah. acid production. Yeah, so, along, along with the alcohol. The along alcohol. with the alcohol yeah. as well. But they didn't talk to him about just the excess carbohydrates or fructose inside right. the diet. They would say, avoid, avoid dried fruit, avoid right. beer, these other stuff, you know, but they're not understanding because they're not on the up and up on the latest research right. in science. So if you do have gout, this is important because there's a lot of things that are going to be a bigger bang for the buck for maybe reducing or significantly lowering in your yeah, diet. Yeah, sugar is a big cause. Sugar is a big one. Okay, yeah. let's talk about saturated fat. And I want to talk about it because when your book first came out and there was a lot of people that had you on their podcast, people like myself, I saw a big movement in the plant-based community because they felt that carbohydrates were being demonized for their association and connection with uric acid and things like fructose were being demonized. But then they would post these memes that would say, well, saturated fat also you know, has this play into this as well. So what are your thoughts about saturated fat and how we should be thinking about it in our in our diets? Well, that's a really good question. So um, the very first thing is that, um, so the very first thing is that there are data, you know, I was on Simon Hill's uh, podcast and right. Simon is a big fan big of- Plant-based plant individual. Plant -based, right. And has and, a podcast and called the Proof. He, 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 had a, he and I had too. a lot of discussions because there is some evidence that uh, high saturated fat can also cause fatty liver, in particular. Not so much the other things, the other problems, but um, for some reason, of the different kinds of fat, saturated fats a little bit more commonly associated with fatty liver. So both sugar and saturated fat seem to be risk factors for for fatty liver. Uh, sugar and fructose is driving the whole metabolic syndrome, but, right. but, but saturated fats are linked with fatty liver. Um, and, uh, and you know, some people have also, of course, linked saturated fats with coronary artery disease and, and the use of statins, but that's actually being challenged more and more. Right. And, and so although we know that the atherosclerotic plaque has cholesterol in it, and, and things like that, it's not so clear that saturated fat really is the primary driver of coronary artery disease. And so yes. that's become a lot more uh, questioned. Contested, questioned, contested. 
and that we're not looking at the health of our endothelial cells right because of our endothelial cells in our arteries and, and that thin lining the endothelial glycation uh coating i forgot yeah. the name my cardiologist was just on the podcast last week talking about this that when we have damaged endothelial cells especially in that coating the plaque is going to be more sticky inside right. of it and the things yeah. that damage it are going to be Fructose and uric acid do. Fructose. The endothelial glycocalyx, they call it. And right, you endothelial can damage glycocalyx. It. Yeah, you can damage that with fructose and high uric acid. I mean, there's good clinical studies looking at this. Totally. Well. So this really starts to unravel it a little bit more yeah. that saturated fat so, may be playing a role, right, right. And in fatty liver. It's not the main driver that maybe yeah. most people are dealing with, but it does call into question that especially we should be thinking about avoiding concentrated forms of saturated fat in our diet. So I, so I will so I did do a I did do a study with saturated fat with butter fat. Yeah. And um and so the study we did is we gave uh butter fat with or without sugar to animals and then we in some of the animals we blocked the fructose metabolism. What we found was that um saturated fat does cause a low grade fatty liver. When you mix it with sugar, you get a very severe fatty liver. And if you block the fructose metabolism, the fatty liver is very mild. So I think that it does drive fatty liver, but it, it's not as power, it's not as powerful as the combination of fructose and fat. That combination is really bad, a fructose and saturated fat for fatty liver. But uh we we have um you know, there have been nice, some nice clinical trials uh, where people where we just reduce fructose and you can improve fatty liver in people. You know, uh, Rob Lustig did a study and uh, I can, you know, I can think of some cases, you know, that I was involved in. My very first, you, you know, when we were just studying fructose, one of the guys in my lab had a son who developed bad fatty liver. He was drinking a lot of soft drinks. We had him cut out the soft drinks. Uh, his mother was an ultrasound technician, so she could monitor his fruit fatty liver, and it just melted away in a few months. And you know, our lab study suggests that sugar is the primary driver of fatty liver. Right. But I agree. I've been, you know, there's enough data to suggest saturated fat can cause fatty liver in itself, but it's. I think it's mild, and uh, I I think that what really drives fatty liver is 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 the sugar maybe the sugar with the fat saturated fat that combination is yeah, bad absolutely uh and then you know now there's uh there's some studies that people are concerned about seed oils seed which, oils. which are polyunsaturated fats and could that be driving the metabolic syndrome and um there's a gentleman named chris kenobi who's put together a very nice argument that the seed oils are very important but i Personally, I believe that the the rise in seed oils correlates a lot with the rise in sugar, mm -hmm. and you know that what's happening is as we become leptin resistance from the fructose, the seed oils as well as any other type of fat are just a high energy diet, uh, high energy calories. So yes, they probably are driving obesity a little bit, but it's because we're becoming leptin resistant from right. The sugar. And you're generally, you know, people aren't going out of their way to consume a ton of seed oils on their right. own exactly like canola oil corn oil right. uh sunflower oil generally when you have a lot of those in your diet it's going to be from highly processed foods which go to the again using the precautionary approach in your life which is that it's probably a good idea to minimize the amount of seed oils that are there because it's generally going to be associated with having highly processed foods in your in your diet you know, there's this other really interesting finding, which is that when you uh, give an animal fructose, they become leptin resistant, which I told you. But when you become leptin resistant, you start desiring fatty foods more. This is a, from work that's been done by some investigators in England, that uh, if you alter leptin signaling, if you block leptin, one of the side effects is that you stimulate uh, the liking of fat more. So it's part of the survival switch, right? You, you, you know, if you, if you want to try to gain fat, you want to start liking fat more. 
Mm. And and so when you become leptin resistant, when you're eating fructose, you, not only are you foraging for food, not only are you hungry, but you you start having a particular desire for fatty foods because they contain so many calories. So it's another way to help store the fat. Well, you just fat. described our modern society, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. People are looking around throughout the day oh, searching gosh. for those concentrated forms of carbohydrates. Yeah. They're drinking their soda. And then they want to go find those M&Ms in the office, yeah. right? They it's want to so, find the next thing. They want that so cake. True. They want that. And then I feel for individuals because, you know, zooming out, all jokes aside, is that there are genuinely so many people that are out there that feel like, why do I always feel so hungry? And I hope that this might give them some insight in addition to all the amazing potential therapeutics that could come for Alzheimer's or the yeah. national emergency that we're in for, yeah. you know, Alzheimer's where we might start to put labels on things that have higher amounts of fructose yeah. or have recommendations of not going above a certain amount, just like we've done with other aspects uh, of our dietary life. But there are so many people that are out there that feel, I just feel so hungry all the time. And this could be one of the mechanisms that would help them understand that actually their body's trying to send them a signal right. that they're full, but they're not hearing the signal because they can't, because there may be elevated levels of fructose that are inside. Yeah. I think the problem is this low ATP, you know, cause that seems to be associated with the craving and all that. So eating more sugar doesn't actually solve that problem. It will just keep the ATP levels low. So doing things like exercise, drinking water, trying to reduce the, the intake of these taking vitamin C, all these things can help bring that energy level up. And if we can bring the intracellular ATP levels back to normal, I think that that we will be healthier. We won't have as much craving. People yeah. won't feel so hungry and yeah. tired at the same yeah, time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. They're hungry all the time. And tired. But they have excess fat on them, but they're also tired. Yes. But they have all this energy, but it's just being stored. It's That's not being right. used for anything. Exactly. The en total energy is high, but it's in the wrong place. It's an amazing theory. Do you call it theory hypothesis? Yeah, it's a hypothesis, but it's really supported. It's and, super you know, it's supported. Very, yeah, super supported. You, we need to do more studies. It's right. it's not time to say fructose is the you know is the cause cause of Alzheimer's. We are not there yet. It's a hypothesis, but but we do know that there's strong. a connection with fructose <laughs> and obesity. Oh. Right. Absolutely. And so for anybody who's listening, who's like, hmm, should I wait for more studies? It's like, well, because you know, there's a connection between fructose and obesity. Why not improve your waistline yep. today? Why right. not have more energy today? Why not avoid poisoning your mitochondria by significantly lowering the fructose that you're subjugating your body to? Yeah, we should. And then the bonus is that if it reduces your risk of Alzheimer's, great. If it doesn't, at least you feel healthier and you look better. Yeah, absolutely right. 100% correct. I walked here today yeah. you know, from the hotel because I figured I wanted to get some exercise. And that's the other beautiful part about it is that when your mitochondria feel better, you actually start to have more energy to want to do things like yeah, working. Absolutely. You look forward to doing that's those right. things. And you know, there's another thing too, like if you go on a low carb diet, you know, that your craving for sugar starts to decrease after a week or two. Right. And so it does that, take some time and it was good that you mentioned that, right? So if yeah. you go low carb or you start reducing your carbs, really tough. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. There's an addiction component that's there. Yeah. But it's, yeah. You know, so I think that there's a lot of positive things that, you know, we should be. What's, what's doing. your highest hope next? You know, you're out there spreading the word because again, I think that there are some immediate things that people can do well, and they can balance it out and say, do I want to start on some of these recommendations? And there doesn't seem like a lot of downside. What's your highest hope from this and putting this hypothesis out there? Well, one of the things that I like about it is, you know, there's a lot of people who have written wonderful things and diets and intermittent fasting and all these great approaches. And, you know, our hypothesis can fit pretty well with, with, with what people are seeing. Like, low, why do low-carb diets work so well? You know, why is it that on a low-carb diet, you can eat a lot of fat but not gain weight? Our, you know, our hypothesis sort of helps to explain that. So one thing is we can explain a lot of the phenomenon, but the other thing is it gives new insights into things like salt, you know, not being so good if you're eating a lot of salt. You need salt if you're exercising, but it's that balance of salt and water. Um, another area is that it suggests that blocking fructose metabolism could be a great solution 
as a therapeutic. And there are now several large pharma that are trying to develop inhibitors of fructose. Uh, I actually have a little company myself where we're trying to um, generate fructokinase inhibitors or fructose inhibitors. And uh, you know we're mainly scientists, so we're, we're not gonna compete that well with the big pharma guys, but, um, but we're trying. And the reason I'm doing that is because just like you say, I would like to have an inhibitor that, I, that we could give at a low price to help a lot of people uh, not, not to, you know, charge thousands of dollars and right. Cause we definitely, it doesn't feel, it doesn't honestly, feel there's good. times where, I that, where I feel not, not, not just the charging more in the companies. And obviously I'm a big proponent of capitalism, but it doesn't feel that we're going to solve this global obesity crisis just through health education. Right. And you know, people don't even cook, right. People literally don't cook. Right. They, they, I think 2012, 13, 14, somewhere around then was the first year that in America, and America is kind of the trend of what's happening in the rest of the world, we spent more money on eating out than we did on groceries combined <laughs> as sort of a society. So wow. generally when you get more resources, you get a pay raise, other stuff, you don't even want to cook. You yeah. end up eating out. So we right. do need therapeutics. We do need things that are there. We're not just going to solve this issue, especially for the people that are most disenfranchised who are working three, four jobs just to provide food on the table. We can't have unrealistic ideas that, oh, you're just, we're just going to teach them how to cook. And that's going to be the thing that's going to yeah. get us out of it. Right. <laughs> right. They, it's, it's too cheap to eat processed foods. Yeah. It's literally too cheap. It's more expensive to eat healthy than it yeah. is to eat processed foods. Yeah. So I am hopeful that we figure out some therapeutics. I'm not sure it's Ozempic. Yeah, exactly. I <laughs> but- agree. I do, I do hope that we find some therapeutics and then there brings up the other point, which is that knock on wood, it doesn't have crazy side effects that right. we discover years later on that yeah. creates some sort of other issue or situation. I mean, what, one of the beauties of blocking fructose metabolism is it blocks the craving of sugar. Yeah. And so let's say you just needed to go on the drug for two or three weeks to help you get you off You figure that out. You know, yeah, even you know, on a penny or two, two pennies, you're yeah. going to be one of the richest men in the world. Yeah, I, I don't care about the rich part. I, what I care about is, you know, to really have an impact because there's just totally. so much. You know, all you have to do as the doctor is go to the wards. Yes. And it's every patient sounds sort of the same. Yes. It's like a litany of diabetes, obesity, coronary artery disease, hypertension, kidney disease, and, you know, Alzheimer's. They're all kind of grouped. Yeah. You know, so it would be nice. It would be nice to be able to have an impact on that. And diet and exercise is the initial way to go, but we, it's true. We probably need something more. Probably need something more if we're going to reach everyone. Yeah. Dr. Johnson, this has been great, Thank right? You, you have a fantastic book out. Thank you. Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, The Surprising Science Behind Why We Gain Weight and How to Prevent It and Reverse It. It goes in detail into uric acid, a lot of your research that's there. The Alzheimer's stuff is being built on top of this, but this book was the foundation. So it's a great yeah, place. Yeah, there's for... a section on Alzheimer's in here Oh, as amazing. Well. So it's a great place. People yeah. can pick it up at Amazon, bookstores, et cetera. Yeah. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. Thank you. Anywhere else you want to send our audience if they want to follow along with your work and research? Well, I do have a website, uh, drrichardjohnson.com. Uh, I put a lot of stuff up there, including uh, some of our recent works. Um, we, we about, we have, uh, we're currently doing some research on linking alcohol and alcoholism with fructose metabolism. So, uh, there's a lot of stuff, uh, you can get from that website. Amazing. We'll have to have you back on <laughs> Thank you. once that study, you have a potent study in the future mm -hmm. that's going to be published yes. on that. Yes. Yeah. So that'll be a round three. I'd okay. love to have you back that on for that. That sounds great. Thank Dr. you Johnson, so much. Thank you again for being on the podcast. Hey YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. If I just told them I put a patient on a diet and he got dramatically better, they would say, Chris Palmer, you're crazy. <laughs> you are crazy. Have you gotten yourself checked out? Because 